All right, good morning, uh, what, board members and guests. I will now call the February 16th, 2022 meeting of the Industrial Development Board to order. It appears we do have a quorum, so we will now uh, start this meeting and, and get this underway. Uh, next item on the agenda is the consideration of the minutes from the January 19th, 2022 meeting. You received those min minutes from the last board meeting held on January 19th, 2022. I will give everyone a couple of moments just to uh, do a uh, review on those. Thank you. That's extremely important, Vice Chair. So, it happens all, the time. <laughs> all right. So there's uh, one misspelling. And um, is the secretary is the secretary supposed to sign it or the vice secretary? I will defer to legal to make sure, Board Member Forster. Uh, it would be either. So if the, the secretary if the secretary is here, then the secretary could sign them for this meeting. All right. Uh, so, are there any besides the uh, change that Quinn? Okay. Can you and can you repeat that just so we'll make sure we get the the spelling is correct? What's the issue? Oh, it's just missing an L. Oh, two L's on your last name. Okay, <laughs> we'll make sure. Again, it happens all the time. Uh, not here, but. All right. I don't know, suddenly for some reason I just thought about Steven Seagal. I don't know, I'm probably aging myself, I don't know. Uh, never thought about that before, so. Okay, thank you for pointing that out. Are there any other questions or comments or changes? All right, uh, if for not, I will entertain a motion to approve the, uh, the minutes from the January 19th, uh, 2022 meeting with the minor clerical changes of uh, correcting Quinn's, Quinn's last name with another L. I'll move uh, as stated. Chair. All right, thank you, Board Member Davis. Do we have a second? All right, thank you, Board Member Forster. Um, any discussion, any other discussion on the minutes? All right, well, let's take a vote then. All those in favor say aye. Aye. All right, thank you, any opposed? All right, thank you. The motion is adopted. Thank you all for that. Moving on to the next item on the agenda, public, which is the public hearing regarding the proposed issuance by the Industrial Development Board of the Government of Metro Nashville and Davidson County, the issue of educational facilities revenue bonds in one or more series in an amount not to exceed $50 million for the Montgomery Bell Academy of University of Nashville Series 2022. Uh, this hearing has been called to allow for the general public and allow the general public the opportunity to express its, its opinions regarding the proposed issuance by the Industrial Development Board of Educational Facilities Revenue Bonds in one or more series in an amount not to exceed $50 million to finance a project located in Nashville, Tennessee for the benefit of the Montgomery Bell Academy of the University of Nashville. The subject bond shall be utilized to finance the acquisition, construction, renovation, and equipping of educational administrative, administrative athletic and related facilities, including without limitation, construction, equipping, and or renovation of the Burke Holder Wellness Center project, football, stadium, plaza, and lacrosse field. 
The project is located at 4001 Harding Pike, Nashville, Tennessee, 37205. The owner is the Montgomery Bell Academy, a Tennessee nonprofit corporation. The Industrial Development Board, the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, the state of Tennessee, or any political subdivision thereof is obligated to pay the principal or redemption price of or interest on the bonds and neither the faith and credit nor the taxing power of the Metropolitan Government of Nashville and Davidson County, Tennessee, the state of Tennessee, or any political subdivision thereof is pledged to the payment of the bonds. With that said, is there anyone present who wishes to speak for or against the project or the financing? All right, if you would like to speak, uh, anyone liking to speak, if you will come here uh, to this podium here, uh, state your name, uh, full name, address, and uh, we'll allow anyone who wants to speak three, three minutes. Oh, I'm sorry. Can you do one more thing? Press the button. There should be a button to the right. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thanks, board. Uh, Jackson Zeitlin, 1822 Fifth Avenue North. Uh, speaking in opposition to this bill, um, blatant misuse of public trust, period. Uh, I am former attendee of Montgomery Bell Academy. That institution does not need our money, does not need the city's engagement, and does not really represent what Nashville should be focusing on at this time. Uh, I think stating that we're gonna uh, work on improving their lacrosse fields when multiple public schools don't have adequate funding for teachers, don't have their own facilities for fitness and education, and we're choosing to put this money on the hill, I think that looks pretty bad. That's all I gotta say. All right, thank you for those comments. We, we greatly appreciate you sharing that with our board. Is there anyone else here wishing to speak? All right, same, same if you'll introduce yourself, full name, um, address, and then also three minutes as well. Thank you. Yep, hit, yeah, hit the, there you go. Okay. Uh, hi, Sarah England, also 1822 uh, Fifth Avenue North, also in opposition, uh, basically same sentiment. I'm not really sure why this is being given our time. I honestly didn't know MBA was a nonprofit, but nonprofits still have to cover their own expenses, so it seems like they're doing something wrong if they need our money. That should be going somewhere else. We should be spending our efforts promoting people that don't have $32,000 a year in tuition. Thank you for your comments. Is there anyone else wishing to speak? All right, and if, and Courtney, do we have, was there any correspondence that came in that we should uh, put on the record pertaining to this matter? There was one email that spoke in opposition of the actual bonds. Okay. So I will attach it to the file for this uh, public hearing. Absolutely, let's, let's do that. Um, are there any other comments? Anyone else wishing to speak? All right. If there is no one else um, wishing to be heard, we will close the public comment period on for this specific item regarding the proposed issuance of the Industrial Development Board bonds in Davidson County, the issue of educational facilities revenue bonds in one or more series in amount not to exceed 50 million for, for the Montgomery Bell Academy of the University of Nashville series 2022. All right, next let's move to item number four, public comment period for the items on the agenda. Uh, is there anyone wishing to speak during this public comment period? All right, seeing as how there is no one, uh, no one from the audience wishing to be heard during this public comment period, we will now uh, close the public comment period and we will move on to item number five on the agenda, new business. Chairman Hodge, I'm sorry, I should have interrupted earlier, but would it be possible for that email to be emailed to us or read aloud just so we can hear what and the public has to say? Um, we have passed that, but 
I, I hear you. Thank you. Um, from legal, I don't. I will defer to legal. I think uh, because you know we have not done that in the past. Uh, I think that what we can do is certainly add it to the file, and therefore it will be made available. Because we have a public comment period for for people to speak. Uh, I will ask legal though if they have any other comments on that. Uh, Mr. Chair, I think actually uh, to the request, I think if, if the board wants to approve or request that the, the email okay. be read into the record, that is an option that is available. Okay. I, as chair, I don't have a personal one way or the other if, if that's kind of the feeling of the board. Uh, I just certainly think we need to consider any precedent set about uh, emails coming in and, and reading those in the meeting when we have a public comment period, but um, if, if that's what the board will allow, it sounds like legal, we can do it, so. It, you know, mindful that there is still an ongoing pandemic and people might not, is it, we're in there, might yeah, not yeah, feel yeah. comfortable coming in and mindful that this is on channel three and people who are watching mm -hmm. don't know what that says and attaching it to the record after the fact it could be considered not fully forthcoming, I would move that we read that into the record. Thank you, Board Member Segal and Board Member Forster for your comments. Josh, from a legal standpoint, do we need to entertain a motion to do that or can, can we just go ahead and, and read that email aloud? I, I'll suggest entertaining a motion. Okay, so let's do this then. Uh, let there, I will entertain a motion to approve reading um, an email that came in related to item number three on the agenda. So moved. All right, thank you. We have a motion from board member Forster. Do we have a second? All right, thank you. Uh, second from board member Segal. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. Aye. Any opposed say nay. All right, motion carried. Uh, Courtney, do you have that print it out or can you bring that to me so I can, Josh, does it matter who reads it from a legal standpoint? I don't think it does. Okay. If you have it, can you read it for us then, Courtney? Sure. As you know, my name is Courtney Pogue. I'm the Director of Economic and Community Development for Metropolitan Nashville. Uh, there was one email that came in in regards to the item on the agenda relating to the bond for the um, Montgomery Bell Academy. Uh, it came in from a Bill Hennessy, and I will read verbatim. I cannot personally attend the board meeting tomorrow since I work a full-time job. I adamantly oppose giving any money, especially $50 million to MBA. This is an elite restricted private school. We have no business subsidizing the wealthy. This is no way, this is a no way move to develop industry or new businesses in Nashville. And I cannot see any way that this is a function of the board. It's just welfare for the wealthy. Thank you, Bill Hennessy, uh, Pepper Ridge Circle, Antioch, Tennessee. Thank you, thank you for sharing that and, and thank you for it. And Josh, do we need to do anything? Because obviously we want to, uh, in the spirit of the board, wanting to have as much uh, feedback as possible, uh, we allowed that to be read, but technically we had moved past the public comment period. Is there anything from a, from a technicality standpoint that we need to do on that end? I don't believe so. Okay, Out outstanding, thank you. Thank you for bringing that up. Uh, so again, going to continuing on item number five, new business. A resolution approving the authorization issuance and sale of $50 million of educational facilities revenue bonds for the Montgomery Bell Academy MBA of the University of Nashville Series 2022 in all matters related uh, there too. Uh, so with, with this item, uh, what, what I like to do is just take a couple of moments and, and we, I think we have some representatives here uh, that uh, can talk to us about this in greater detail and then certainly allow our colleagues, our board members time to 
um, ask any questions, but, but certainly what I want to do, I thought it was important just from a factual standpoint, just to make sure that we're all clear on some of the facts related to bond issuances in general. Um, and, and certainly with this being one that has not become before, this type does not come before the board. So couple couple items, I think one to, to clarify, um, again, just general information. And, and I've asked Bob to, to add, chime in on this, um, if there's uh, any other feedback, but I just wanna make sure we frame this, the facts properly, just in context as we get forward and, and look to getting more information and certainly uh, having a, re a robust discussion today. Uh, for, first of all, uh, when it comes to the, the bonds, uh, there is no money that is for this particular proposal that is coming from Metro. Uh, there's no money coming from the Industrial Development Board. Uh, it, when we do these bond deals, the, the arrangement, the IDB is the issuer of the bond, certainly. But I think it's important to understand also just as I was thinking about this, why do, why do organizations and companies come before us? Um, and that's because this board has the ability to, to uh, issue tax exempt bonds. Um, why does that matter? I think that's really important to understand it. And at the core, uh, when this board issues tax exempt bonds, if you're a borrower, uh, typically the bank, the bank will not have to pay interest income on the, uh, the interest received from the borrower. And that then allows the bank to offer the borrower a lower interest rate, which obviously uh, saves money. So that's, that's why this board, that's why people in general come before this board. And obviously just as a reminder to our board members, we have done several bond issuances of recent one related to the Century Farms infrastructure. Um, there was also one for an affordable housing project as well that we recently approved uh, over in East Nashville off, off Dickerson Road. So that's kind of just the background on, on why I thought that was important to share. And specifically as it relates to 5013Cs, this board does have the ability to issue uh, bonds to 5013C organizations. Uh, this board has done that in the past. Uh, it has, we have not approved, and Bob, correct me if I'm wrong, this board has not approved any bonds for schools uh, since, in, since the current group has been on the board. Is that correct? Probably since the, it is correct. Yes. Regarding this current board, uh, just for clarity, uh, this board has issued a number of industrial development bonds uh, for schools, uh, private schools, and also um, other educational facilities that are uh, appropriate and that meet the requirements. So, yeah. and again, the, that's the answer. Yes, thank you. And again, this is just because this has not come before this board, this type of organization for a new bond. So I just want to share that information, make sure all, all of our board members that we have all the information. Uh, and, and then, I, I, and, and Bob, tell me this too, under our statute, and Josh, if you need to chime in, legally this board is also, part of our statute can issue these types of bonds, in, and I'm speaking in general here, um, we can do that um, as part of our statute and charter. and and. And but maybe you might be best. It's my understanding the way that the why this is something that boards do or can do um, is that certainly with with these types of projects, if there's if there's a new project, a construction project, or et cetera, uh, you know, if it's millions of dollars, there's there's labor involved, there's construction. So so the goal is to generate some sort of economic impact. Is 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 that right? Kind of from a just philosophical background standpoint. I can understand that argument being made. Okay. Uh, frankly, uh, the I think uh, Vice Chair Siegel did a really good job in her statement that was um, in the actually in the public press, uh, saying that this is something that is good for our community. Um, the board will determine whether it's good policy, but mm -hmm. in terms of legality, um, this has been done again and again, and it's been done because educating people um, 
in our community is important. And yep. it's done a variety of different ways. So I agree with you that in addition to that, there's labor and there's sure. expenditures and so on. But, but what this would amount to, just to be blunt, is a refinancing of some existing indebtedness that will be paid for by Montgomery Bell Academy, and it will be done through Pinnacle Bank. And they will buy the bond, only one. And so that's legal, authorized, et cetera. Yep. And just to clarify again, there's no money. Uh, and we've had this come up before, but I just want to make sure, just like other bonds that have come up before us in the past, uh, there's no money coming being provided by Metro. The money is being provided by the bank in the event that a borrower should default. There's no recourse to Metro nor the IDB. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right. Well, thank you. And like I said, I know we'll, our colleagues will probably have some questions, uh, so that's outstanding. I think we do have some individuals from representing MBA and, and maybe Pinnacle Bank as well. So if you will, we'll, we'll do what I like to do. You yeah, come up here. Uh, the, anybody that's representing MBA, I'd like you to, to do this. Let's speak on that first. If you will introduce yourself, give us your address, uh, kind of your role, give us some background on the project. Um, and then from there, I'd like uh, your pinnacle to you know, share any information that you may have. And then from there, I will turn it over to my colleagues for any questions that they may have for MBA or specifically for the bank on how this deal is uh, set up. So anyway, with that said, turn it over to you. Thank you. I, I, I'll, Russ Miller uh, with Bassbury and Sims. Uh, we are representing Pinnacle Bank in this transaction. Uh, we're also serving as bond counsel, which basically means we've done the tax work uh, to determine that these are bonds are, are eligible to be issued as federally tax exempt bonds. And just to clarify, so you are not in, you are not representing MBA today? Correct. We are not counsel to MBA. Okay. Today. All right. Thank you. Next, if you want to introduce yourself. Sure. My name is Mark Tipps. Uh, I am uh, the athletics director at MBA. I teach American government economics. <coughs> coach seventh grade football and varsity baseball. Um, I'm here today because our headmaster could not make it, and so I'm pinch hitting for him. And uh, I'll, let, I'll let our director of finance introduce herself. Hi, I'm Vicki Matthews, uh, Montgomery Bell Academy director of finance. And I'm um, you know, here with Mark today because our headmaster couldn't be here, just offering support, happy to answer any questions that I can. Well, for, well, before we turn it over, do you want to give us a little over, give us a short overview summary of the project, um, why you decided to, to go this path, and kind of what the funds were used for or will be used for? And that could be in either or. So maybe if somebody from NBA wants to speak to the project, maybe in, in detail, just an overview summary of the project for the board. Sure. Uh, some time ago, uh, the school made a determination to try to replace a uh, uh, a gym that was built, I believe, uh, in, in about 1957 and uh, began working on a new athletic facility. Uh, that construction <coughs> started probably in, I don't know, 2018, 2019. It went on for a good period of time. It was completed, substantially completed, January of last year. Um, and at the time, it was the decision that the Board of Trustees made to go forward with it, they looked at different ways to finance it and debated different ways to finance it. And uh, I think based on uh, current laws and advice of counsel, that they knew that they could preserve the possibility of using tax-exempt bond financing to do that. So they passed a resolution to preserve that ability, went forward with the construction, paid for it as they went along, um, and then more recently decided that they did want to use tax exempt bond financing to try to, as Mr. Took said, uh, kind of refinance or, or recapture at least a portion of the cost of that facility, uh, which would represent about 50%. It would be about a 50% debt financing because the, the project was about $100 million. The school, uh, I've been there seven years. <laughs> Prior to my coming to school, had I know issued 
or had issued at least two uh, tax exempt bond financings, had pursued at least two tax exempt bond financings through this board. I think one was in the ballpark of 2010 and one was in the 1990s. So that was uh, what they had done before. Pinnacle Bank's proposal was that they go through the IDB, um, and that's why they filled out the application and, and, and came here, was to try to take advantage, as Mr. Took said, and as you all referred to, uh, the money comes from Pinnacle, but take advantage of the lower interest rates in order to uh, recoup some of the expenditures for those capital improvements. Thank you, thank you for that, uh, Russ. If you if you want to kind of talk more detail to the board, and obviously you've been before us before, but about the the uh, setup and details of the actual bond issuance, any other details you want to share, and then I'll I'll turn it to my colleagues for questions. Sure, uh, thank you, Chairman. Um, I, you you did a good job of, ex, of uh, explaining what type of bonds these are and the uh, impact to Metro that that these bonds have. Um, as you mentioned, there's no Metro funds involved here. There's no IDB funds involved here. Um, there's no backstop <coughs> subsidy guarantee by Metro government uh, of these bonds. Um, additionally, I'd say there's issuing these bonds has no impact on the ability of this board or Metro to issue bonds for any other types of projects. There's not a limited um, number of bonds can be issued, so it really has no impact on um, other bond deals that this that this board might do. Um, this is. This is merely just, um, <clears throat> we would refer to this board in this capacity as a conduit issuer. Congress has passed a law that allows 51C3s to issue bonds on a tax exempt basis um, through a governmental issuer. Um, and so, as you mentioned, Pinnacle Bank is providing the funds to purchase this bond and um, is loaning the money to uh, MBA and looks solely to MBA to, um, uh, for repayment. And there's no, there's no metro uh, involvement at all in the repayment of the bonds. Um, with respect to this, I, I guess the only other thing I would say, and, and, sure. and Bob uh, could test this too, this is a pretty common financing for 51C3s um, across the country. Uh, uh, Nonprofit non schools, uh, colleges and universities, you'd be hard pressed to find any colleges and universities that don't have tax exempt bonds outstanding. Um, many, many K through 12 schools um, in Tennessee and outside Tennessee have, have tax exempt bonds outstanding. Just like this, nonprofit hospitals use this sort of financing. Um, really, almost any any kind of 51C3 that has a large project is is going to borrow on a tax exempt bond basis, just because that is what Congress has made available to them. Um, I don't know, Bob. Does that does that seem accurate? I, I, based on your experience, <laughs> yeah. Um, <clears throat> so, with respect to this uh, particular bond deal. Um, uh, as Mr. Tips described, it's a reimbursement bond, essentially. Um, uh, the law allows uh, MBA to pass a resolution uh, at the beginning of construction of this project that says um, we are, are reserving the right to issue sort of permanent financing on a tax exempt basis for this deal. Um, that allows them to essentially self-fund and not have to incur a construction loan for the pro for during the process of constructing, not have to pay interest on a construction loan, go through a construction loan process. Um, they can just take it, they can, they can um, reimburse themselves and recoup those expenditures with a permanent financing when they're ready to do so. Um, and that's, uh, that's why we're here before this board now. Uh, the specifics of the financing, um, as you mentioned, it's, they're asking for not to exceed $50 million. Um, it will be, um, if approved, a tax exempt bond um, held by Pinnacle Bank. Pinnacle Bank is uh, purchasing the bond with the intent to hold it as a loan. There's no, uh, and sometimes in these sorts of deals, you'll see um, the bonds sold into the public market. That's not the intent of Pinnacle. Pinnacle is just holding this loan. Um, it's a it's a it's a long maturity, 30 years, um, at a fixed rate, and so it's a good um, it's a it's a good financing. And, and I will say also, MBA did a um, an RFP process to identify the the best uh, bank that they that they could, and, and chose Pinnacle in that process. All right. Thank you for sharing that. Uh, is there anything else that Anyone has to say before we turn it over to before I turn it over to my colleagues for questions? All right, that sounds good. So what, what I'd like to do here, uh, certainly fellow board members, certainly give everyone a chance to ask any questions of our guests, uh, and then after that, certainly uh, we can have our bond council provide an overview of uh, the the actual documents and take any specific <coughs> questions that uh, this board may have pertaining to those uh, next. So I will start to my Right. I'll start with board member Forrester. Do you have any questions or comments for uh, our guests today? Um, 
Yes. So I would have I would have expected that that this would have come before a different board, the Health and Education Board. Can can you explain that process and why it did not go there? Uh, I'm I'm happy to speak to that. I, there, there's really no magic to that. Um, this, um, the IDB statute allows the IDB to finance um, educational facilities, um, nonprofit educational facilities, and so it's it's authorized to be issued by this board. Um, MBA, just based on past practice, has used this board. Um, there's there's really no there's no particular difference um, uh, between the boards as far as um, what MBA would be getting. Um, as I said, it's just. It's really just a conduit issuer, um, and so uh, past practice was to use the Industrial Development Board for MBA, and that's um, that's what we, we we had no reason to to choose a different board, I guess, in this particular time. Well, I think I'm going to defer uh, other questions for the moment because I, I I hope there's a robust robust discussion about this, um, and I, I want to listen. Thank you for your comment, your question, Board Member Forrester. Board Member Hannah, if you have any questions or comments for our guests, please go ahead. Thank you. Actually, I was going to have the exact same question. I just pulled up the Health and Education Facilities Board website, and it seemed like that was the, the more appropriate board for this application. So I, too, would like to defer and listen. Board Member Segal, you're next. If you have any questions or comments for our guests. Um, I do. Um, I normally go last, so I feel like I'm in the hot seat today. Um, no hot seat. <laughs> no hot seats. Um, I, so I, I want to touch a little bit on the history of this deal first and then get into some other questions I have for both MBA and bond council, but also for the city and for our attorney, because I think that we need to make sure we're all on the same page with respect to how we're going to proceed as a board and how we're going to analyze deals like this. So my timeline was a little fuzzy and I have the benefit of having corresponded with MBA's lawyer yesterday to try to clear that up. Those comments have been shared with the board and I think should probably be attached to the record as well um, if we can do that so that if people want to know what was said by your attorney they have a right to see that. Um, it's not rocket science and I'm going to go over it, but I just want to disclose that. Um, this project construction started in 2018, correct? That it, sounds about <laughs> right. <laughs> it, it was, it was actually, I think in, in the early 2019. Uh, 2019. It's when we, you know, sort of started construction. Started when you Prior to that, there was, you know, architect and engineering, you know, drawings and so forth. But actually okay. starting of the construction uh, was in uh, early 2019. Okay. Yeah. And it, it, yeah. it was completed a year ago in January we moved in. So that would have been 2021. And, yeah, that sounds about right because it okay. feels like it was about a two-year COVID time is funny, yeah. right? Yeah. Um, exactly. Yeah. But um, that would have only been the, the Burkholder facility. That, that's true. Yeah. That was just the Burkholder facility. There was also the, the redoing the football stadium piece of it started earlier. So I guess if you go back there, that's the date you're talking about? Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I, yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, and so when the board looked at this project, that would have been in probably 2017, maybe long range planning before you get into even starting your soft cost and I construction think process? So my understanding is that the soft cost started in late 18. Okay. That's my understanding. Okay. And just for people who may be listening, soft costs mean the construction you do before you break ground. Um, and so the board at some point, maybe in 2018, that's when, and I got a little confused, so I just want to make sure I'm not trying to trick anybody. I just want to make sure I understand. That's when the board said, we may want to finance this later, but we're going to table that for now. And that was April of 19. April of 19. Okay. And they passed the resolution. Yes, okay. That, that was that, when just, Sorry to... Yeah. If you don't mind, um, that, that's just that is a, a federal tax tax law concept um, to pass a, a reimbursement resolution at the time, and that's what they did. It's a just a, a resolution that says we're going to start incurring costs, but we may want to to um, take those costs out in the future with taxes and bonds. Yeah. And so that's what they did. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Um, and and so there were no conversations had with 
the then ECD office or the city or the HEFB at that time. Is that correct? Not to my knowledge. Uh, I'm not aware of that either. <clears throat> I don't know. Okay. Um, and so construction goes along. There's a football field, a pavilion, a wellness center. I feel like I saw on the website squash courts, the lacrosse field. Yes, Am I missing any part of it? No, that's, that's, that's basically it. right. What we did was uh, we, they, we rebuilt the home side of the football stands. Uh, and then the area behind that that goes to the new facility is, I guess, what you would refer to as a pavilion. Sometimes it's more like a wind tunnel. But um, then the new facility is about a 200,000-square-foot building okay. that has lockers and gyms and, and practice, uh, uh, basketball, wrestling, uh, offices, gathering spaces, et cetera. And then on the other side of that, facing... Uh, West End Avenue is a lacrosse field, lacrosse stadium that abuts the new, the new is, facility. Is that down in the floodplain or just outside the floodplain? No, you're 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 thinking about the, the oh. lower field that abuts yeah. West End. If you were to turn up West or uh, uh, Montgomery Bell Academy, yes, and go up, you would see now um, uh, abutting Montgomery Bell Academy is a big green space that is the lacrosse field then the building, and then the football stadium is behind that. Okay. I have a pretty good feel for where yeah. this is. I yeah. went to BGA. Right, right, I traveled right. with your speech and debate team. I, I've ghost go. written articles for your newspaper. Um, my grandparents lived on Kempelong for 50 okay. years. Well, so it's I'm right before you get to Kempelong. If you turn left, turn you'll left. be right into the back of the building. Right there. Okay. Um, my son also sometimes goes to, to day camps um, during holidays there. So we've been there, but I think last time I was there, the fences were probably <clears throat> still up. Um, so, at what point did y'all put out your RFP? When was that? For construction for or the, for the financing? For the financing. June, I would say, I would say in December. Of 2021? Yes, ma'am. So, almost a year after substantial completion. Correct. Um, and what was the next best offer to coming here what for, you for your financing options? What was your second best option? I don't know that the board has explored another option. Do you? I think you're referring to the, the uh, council referred to the fact that there were other uh, banks who bid on it. Yes. Yeah. I don't know what the details of those <laughs> banks were. But I think she's asking other than the IDB. Is Did that what you're asking? Did all the other banks base their bid on coming to the IDB? I, 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 don't, I don't know the answer to that really because I didn't see the RFPs, but any bank that would have proposed, I think would have either did. proposed taxable or tax exempt financing, and any tax exempt financing would have to go through a conduit issuer. Um, mm -hmm. That would be either the IDB or the health bank. So there were no proposals made to go through the HEFB or to, to do taxable financing? No, ma'am, not that I'm aware of. Not that I'm aware of. Okay. Um, and I'm trying to get a good feel for actually how much money MBA is saving by coming before this board, mindful that tax-exempt financing is always cheaper, but the overnight interest rate right now is only 0.5, so I would imagine that taxable financing is actually <clears throat> probably in the range of 2 to 4% on an interest rate right now. Um, but it looks like y'all haven't explored that option. Is that correct? Uh, I, I don't I don't know if they've looked at taxable versus tax exempt. I, I will say that currently the, the spreads between taxable and tax exempt are probably 75, 75 basis points or so. Um, and so it's not, it's not in, insignificant, I guess. Okay, and I know what that means, but will you just explain for folks who yeah, are in public finance so, what that means? Um, uh, kind of as the chairman was explaining at the beginning, the, the point of these bonds is that the, the holder, Pinnacle Bank, doesn't have to pay interest on the, um, uh, I just have to pay income tax on the interest that it's paid on the bonds. And so because Pinnacle uh, or the holder of the bonds doesn't have to pay that income tax, they're able to offer a lower rate um, to the borrower. It's the same, same sort of bond. Tax exempt bonds are issued by cities and counties um, and other conduit issuers, and so that's why Metro Nashville borrows on a, on a cheaper basis than, um, than they could uh, otherwise do it to, to a bank. But in any event, 
The point of all that being um, the interest rate is effectively lower that, that the bank is able to offer. Um, and, um, <clears throat> you know, their banks have cost of funds, and those cost of funds, you know, are what they are. But whether or not they have to pay the income tax allows them to give a lower rate. And so, as I said, I think basically the rate difference here between a taxable and a tax-exempt loan would be in the neighborhood of uh, 0.75 percent, yeah, 75 basis points. Which, yeah. which on on $50 million in bonds is three. So it's when I have to. I don't, I don't do math if, in public. If it could so. only be $100 million, I could probably do this pretty Lawyers quickly. don't do math, right? <laughs> that's why. Not yeah, without right. Unless it's billable hours, <laughs> then you can do math. Right. I will say also, I mean, it's a 30-year financing, so it's a it's a pretty big, it would be a pretty big difference between those two rates. Right. Um, yeah, we'd need a calculator that I don't think I have on my phone to really <laughs> run that out. But, but in the six figures is probably where that would land, do you think, five figures? I, I, I don't know. The, the other issue, I guess, is that this would be, you know, a, a fixed rate for 30 years. Uh, and what today's rates might be, uh, you know, that we could get if we borrowed today, we might not have that rate if it were a five-year, 10-year, 20, 30-year loan. And so that's part of it, too. And, as, you know, right now we're sort of in a rising rate environment. Um, the, the proposals that were, that were provided to us, I think we had six proposals, and it was, they were pretty much all, um, you know, tax-free bond proposals because that's what seems to be the most favorable, uh, seems to be the smartest decision for our board to make. If that's the best deal that we can get, I think they feel that's what they should look for, you know. Just it's their fiduciary responsibility as a board member to, to do that. To try to get their best deal. That makes yes, total sense. Um, it, and so I guess the board didn't believe it could get a fixed rate on private financing. Is that right? I don't know if they could or not, but it would it would cost more. It wouldn't be the very best deal. Okay. Um, and so at that point, y'all decided to move forward with Pinnacle. And I believe I sent a copy of that bond application, and that was filed with Metro Finance, I believe, was your first point of contact on February 2nd. Know. Is that correct? Uh, it was filed on February 2nd with uh, Bob and Josh and Courtney by email. Okay, yeah. okay. I have an email chain, and I think the last one I have was the IDB date, so I wasn't totally sure who ended up catching that first email. I don't, I don't, I sent, I sent, the only, the first email that I sent, because I helped them fill out the application as, as bond counsel, I guess, um, uh, was to Bob and uh, Josh and Courtney, and I think that was, I think my initial email was maybe to just ask the meeting schedule of the board, okay. um, and uh, and then the application followed. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, and I believe in that first email you said you would follow up with the bond documents, but I couldn't tell when were those provided to Metro. Uh, so we uh, we we would have sent the resolution. I'm sorry. The um, I'm sorry. I, I don't remember exactly the dates, but I, I filed the application on February second. I think I sent the a copy of the resolution uh, that you all have on that date. Um, and then I would guess maybe a week after that, because um, once we, you know, that's when we started working on drafting the bond documents um, okay. after, the bond, after the application was um, forwarded. And so we drafted the bond documents, circulated it to our sort of working group, and then once we had the comments incorporated, um, submitted to the board. Um, but I think, again, I. I don't know the date of that, but Thursday sticks in my mind. I don't know. Um, I don't know what date it was, but I would have sent the same people. So either Thursday, February tenth, or I, that the third, the day after. It wasn't the five. third. It definitely so it would have been third. February tenth. Yeah. 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 Okay. <clears throat> um, and then we, as a board, received them the very next day, which I would like to thank the mayor's office for because um, I know that turning those around. That quickly was probably pretty difficult. Um, in my experience, in my practice, that's a pretty compressed schedule. And I'm curious if you've, if in your experience, for a, a 
bond, a tax exempt bond, if that feels a little compressed based on what you've experienced before? Uh, not necessarily. I mean, I, when people would ask, when people call with deals and say, you know, everybody wants to, always wants to do deals as quickly as they can, um, uh, but we would usually say, probably 30 to 60 days from when we start until when we can have it completed is is a as a good estimate on deals like this because we have to you know we have to go meet the board schedule and get before the board so right. um, 30 days is quick 60 days is you know probably um, doable and that would be from sort of when we start to when we close okay and, and I guess you know the part of the reason <coughs> MBA and everybody else want to do deals as quickly as they can, particularly in this environment, is um, rates are, don't seem to be going down, I guess. And so you want to do it as quickly as you can to lock in the rates as quickly as you can. Yeah. I, think, I, think if I, I think Mr. Whitson, in his email exchange with you, yep. uh, said the two, the two reasons that I'm aware of were that point, the, the, uh, we agreed with our lender, Pinnacle, that we would try to close as quickly as we can because they had locked in a rate and they were you know, put them in kind of a difficult yeah, situation. Yes. And then the second reason was because of the IRS period of recoupment that was running, at least with respect to some of the expenditures, and there was a deadline maybe sometime at the end of March or something, as I recall. So there was a little bit of a, a reason to try to, to move forward with it. Uh, when does that deadline run? So basically it's a um, it's sort of a three-year rolling deadline uh, that – you, you have three years from when you make an expenditure to reimburse yourself for it. And so, um, you know, as the days pass by, the expenditures that were made in early March of 2019 would no longer be reimbursable. So, so it's just a... I guess I'm a little confused as to how that's a problem. If it if you spend $100 million and you're only getting 50 back, it would seem that you have a pretty good cushion there. It, am, am I missing something about that? I think that's probably right, yeah, okay. that, the, that there would be reimbursable expenses... Um, Available. Available yeah. for, for quite some time during yeah. construction. Yeah. Right. Um, so as a board member and as a member of the public, this feels pretty rushed to me. So that I think we sort of walked through that it is pretty rushed, that documents were only provided to the IDB on the 10th, and here we are on the 16th. And and those documents haven't even been out in the in the public for people to see until Monday morning when I very casually pulled up my email from Courtney that he sent after hours on Friday just to get it done, I'm sure, and thought, oh, I'll just print this so I can read it tonight and knock it out. And I, and I read it and I saw MBA and I thought, well, surely that's not like MBA, MBA. That's probably like a company called MBA. And, and I dug into it and I read your full name, which I was never aware of, and I got really confused. And then I pulled up Parcel Viewer, and the names matched. And I thought, well, well, it is MBA, so let's make sure this is out there because people need to know that we're being asked at the last minute <coughs> to involve ourselves in a $50 million bond deal. So I think that's one concern that, as a board, we really need to think about. We have six of our nine members here today, and so – and I'm sure people had already made plans to not be here, not realizing that we were going to be doing a $50 million bond deal today. So I have some concerns with that. And I'm, and I'm hoping that everybody understands this timeline and knows that it, it's pretty rushed. And it's not necessary to rush it because you actually have time left to recoup some of this money. Lenders are always going to try to rush things. That's their literal job. So I, while I respect their desire to get the deal done, I don't think a lender's timeline should necessarily affect our ability to do due diligence. The other thing I kind of want to talk about is you just have spent this money already. You had the money, you had the cash to do it, you've spent it, and now you'd like the cash back. So all these improvements have been substantially completed for over a year. So when we talk about giving you your cash back and we talk about what we believe in as a board, we believe in economic development. It's our literal defined purpose. By giving you cash back, we're not creating new jobs. We're not creating new opportunities for the people of Davidson County. We're just allowing you to invest it differently, which may or may not affect the economy here at all, frankly. Um, so I have some concerns about that, and I think the questions you've answered have made those clear as well. The other concerns that I have 
deal with the fact that MBA has taken the position that this doesn't cost our board anything. And I believe, Russ, is the application fee $750, is that right? Uh, that, that is correct, yeah. And that's the only fee you pay to the IDB for this, correct? Um, yeah, I mean, I, any costs that uh, are part of the deal are paid by the borrower. So um, council fees or anything like that from the IDB would all, any fees are covered, I guess, that are incurred. But there's no, but you're correct, there's no separate um, IDB fee. Right. Um, and other than that, I have to be. And um, I, I know for a fact that that is unusual among IDBs. I know that our IDB charges less than Chattanooga, than Knoxville, than Memphis for these deals by a wide margin. I know that people in the mayor's office would like to see these fees increased because we're not charging enough to even cover our own costs. And I know that a lot of advocates believe that one of the ways that we can make the city more equitable is to use fees from deals like this to help support those efforts. Our, and I'm saying this because I know we have some new people on the board, so I just want to make sure everybody understands the history because I don't think this has come up since a couple of our folks have joined this board, but this IDB is an independent board of Metro. We are not controlled by Metro. Metro does not set our fees. And for many, many years, ECD and Metro Legal were not involved in this board because of questionable deals that were done in the past. We now have a relationship with Bob, who represents us as outside counsel. We have oversight by Metro Legal, and ECD is directly involved in our dealings. And Metro Legal and ECD and, and Metro Finance do all this at, at no cost to us, and they don't have to do that. They don't have to be here. It's a service that they provide to us to give us their time. And I think it's a relationship that's really benefited us. It seems to me, though, when we talk about doing these types of private bonds, given that Metro is providing free services to us, we have to really think about whether or not this is actually a free deal to taxpayers because Metro can't give away its time and its opportunity cost to, to MBA. That's not fair to taxpayers. And so one of the questions I have for my fellow board members is if we are going to consider this today and we're not going to just up or down vote and we're not going to defer it, is it time to reconsider the fee that we charge for this is it time to engage in conversations with Metro Legal to discuss an intergovernmental agreement where you pay us a fee that we can then remit to Metro Legal and to ECD for their actual time spent on these deals to compensate them so that they truly are not losing money for a deal for MBA, which is what they're doing. And also to say, maybe take a part of that fee and dedicate it to the Barnes Fund or to other matters that would help cover the opportunity cost loss when somebody in Courtney's office or Metro Legal has to spend time helping you save money when they could have been spending time finding nonprofit affordable housing developers and teaching them about these bond programs. So those are really my concerns with this deal, and I think the timeline really highlights some of those problems. I suspect that there's an economics teacher at MBA who could probably explain the value of time and opportunity costs better than me, but I hope that I have done a good enough job that y'all can see what these concerns are. And my question to you would be, what is that figure? What fee would you as MBA be willing to pay to continue with this so that we can think about whether we can use those funds in ways that cover these time costs and opportunity costs. Because otherwise, this is a bad deal for the city of Nashville because we're spending time and money to do something that doesn't benefit the bulk of Nashvilleians. I think that's all I got. Thank you for, thank you for your questions today, Board Member Segal. I think that was a question to, do you, does anyone from your team want to respond to that from MBA or the bank? Well, I, I'm I'm not really sure how to respond. I, yes. I'm not sure we should negotiate. It, it feels okay. a little All right. odd to me. But um, I, would, I, I, I will just say I, I, this this board charges the application fee. I, I don't think um, 
to the extent Metro Legal is used, I mean, I, MBA is, is um, you know, appreciative of that, certainly. Um, to the extent there are costs incurred, um, like I said, MBA uh, as a borrower pays those costs in, in connection with this deal. And so, uh, but they certainly don't set the board's fee. Um, and no. so, I, you know, if you all see that a fee is appropriate, I, that's certainly, you know, something the MBA would consider in paying. I, I, don't, I don't know how to answer the, that question either, other than I, I will say, I, while I, I fully appreciate your, your points and, and respect them, the, the practice and the law as it relates to this board and other boards that issue tax-exempt bonds is in place and has been for a long time. We, we didn't uh, come here to try to do anything new or special. You may be raising things that are perfectly valid, but they seem to be perhaps things that ought to be discussed um, either with the state legislature or whoever authorizes this, and there may be policy considerations that need to be addressed. Uh, we just followed the, the protocol and the practice that we've done before that council has laid out and that others have done. And so I don't, I don't feel like we're not here trying to take advantage of you or anyone sitting here, we're doing the same thing that many other, as Mr. Took said, many other educational uh, entities have done. And y your points may be very, very valid, but they seem to be things that should be considered it, it, among other policy makers, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, and, and let me just say, Go ahead. With, with all due respect, I don't think that y'all had ill intentions in coming here today or expected necessarily to have the reaction that folks are having. I would just make the important point that being permitted to do something by state law doesn't mean we must do something by state law. And we have a finite amount of resources and not just this board's time, but Metro Legal's time, Courtney's office's time. I'm amazed every time Courtney's office gets literally anything done, but the things that they get done on top of it given how small it is relative to not just similarly situated cities, but like much smaller cities. Yeah. Um, and so we as a city need to think about not what, what, what the breadth of what we can do is, but where we have to focus. Yeah. And so to me, if we're going to take the time to do something like this, we need to make sure that it's not taking away from our focus. I respect that, and if there's if, if if there's further discussion to be had at some point on that, I mean, we certainly, as Mr. Miller said, we would be open to talking about something. Yep. Thank you for your comments, questions, Board Member Segal. I will uh, go here to Board Member Cordova for any questions or comments. Well, I had one question. Um, you all mentioned that you used the IDB for two previous um, transactions like this. I was curious what those projects were and um, sort of any scope that you have, if you have any context for that. Uh, the one in the one in about 2010 was for our dining hall and maybe the Lowry building, a couple of, you know, a um, dining hall classroom building and then another classroom building. Um, the one in the 90s, I'm not sure. I'm not sure what that one was for. That you know predates me, but um, I'd say also just generally speaking, it's not uncommon for a 51C3 to have a host of projects that they, you know, hold and finance all at one time. So it may not have been one. Sure. Specific. Yeah, I'm, I'm just. Yeah. I was just curious. Thank you for for coming today. Sure. Board Member Cordova, any questions or any other questions or comments? All right. Go to Board Member Davis. For our guests, any questions or comments? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chair. Uh, not really for the guests um, necessarily. I mean, yeah, I, I get the gist of the project. It was news to me today that it already happened and we were more of a refinance. I didn't actually realize that coming in and definitely appreciate all the vice chair's comments. And this has been a little bit illuminating uh, for me today. Um, some of my questions have already been answered. My questions are, I guess, more for the board or legal or that sort of thing, just in general rather than, you know, the, the project folks. But, like, the first one was we're giving any money. We're not. I, I do understand that. This is 
more of a they're coming for tax exempt. Can, can I interject very quickly, Board Member Davis? Yeah. Certainly, this is your ask any questions. I would just say specifically related to the documents. Um, maybe hold off on those questions because we can have uh, Bob give a brief summary and then we can get into detail sure. on that. Just, yeah, just yeah. as a suggestion. And so we. Yeah, and I'm not going to get in the weeds on that or anything. Okay. I, I, it's more of just overall board, you know, questions for ourselves, I guess, or Josh. But. Yep. Um, so, you know, tax exempt lending, I, I think I know the answer to this. I'm hearing we've done this in the past for other nonprofits, but do we. Do we do this for other nonprofits? Is this a kind of a regular occurrence? Because I haven't, it feels a little different. I know we've done some affordable housing thing, but it, it does feel like something we haven't done, at least in the two years I've been around. But um, I don't know if that's for Bob, but do yeah. we, do, we do this kind of thing for other nonprofits, I'm hearing. Is that correct? Well, okay. yes. Well, certainly, obviously, MBA has come before this board before. So in the past, uh, yeah. uh, we've done that. There's been deals for the YMCA as well. Um, and I, I want to say that this board, uh, certain people, I know I've been on the board, we've done amendments, not necessarily new bond issuance, but uh, this board has approved amendments to uh, other organizations of with the same status. Bob, do you have anything yeah. to add on that based on your history? I think that's a fair and accurate statement about it. But just, I guess, maybe for the record a bit, um, you've heard a number of transactions that the IDB has participated in. Um, yes, 2010 uh, was with Montgomery Bell Academy. The, the 19, the one in 90, when? Uh, Eight. In the 1990s, I'm not sure. In the 1990s. Years. Incredibly, it was before my time with the board. <laughs> I didn't think that was possible. Um, but Donaldson Christian Academy, uh, Goodwill Industries, uh, the Nashville Symphony, a um, uh, couple of more Goodwills, I'm happy to say, uh, uh, St. Paul's Bond Retirement, um, YMCA, uh, Loths, West End Summit, uh, Country Music Foundation. Um, et cetera, so that there have been St. Paul Christian Academy. So there have been a number of them, and it's all perceived to be good public policy. Uh, but well, I think the vice chair is correct that that doesn't mean that this board should not um, apply its notion of policy. Sure. But I don't want anybody, I don't want the record to reflect that this board has, has not done this before. It's, it's part of our function yeah. of this board. Um, board member, yeah. thank you, uh, Bob. Sure. Board member Davis, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think okay. it does. I was, um, I guess my follow up to that was is there a dollar minimum when we do this sort of thing? Is it, is it, does it have to be over a million dollars or is it just kind of, uh, you know, what is the, the threshold that it even makes sense for people to come to board to do this? There, there's no specific okay. minimum or statutory restriction or anything like that. Okay. Yeah, I mean, because one of my thoughts was, as I, again, this is all just unfolding pretty quick, is, you know, are we going to have nonprofits kind of lining up to do this sort of thing? You know, obviously, you've got a big list there of people that have come in the past, and um, sounds like we at least have done a few a year in the past. Yeah, I don't know. I just, that, that was my thought just my initial gut process is like, are all nonprofits going to start lining up to do this? What, you know, what, what is the benefit there? Um, you know, so just a thought I had, um, I remain open to it. Uh, you know, again, uh, the, the vice chair's <coughs> thoughts definitely, you know, I'm, are sinking in a little bit in that, you know, uh, the project's already happened. We're doing this refi, you know, it's more of a refi kind of thing. Um, I'm sort of just, you know, kind of hearing a lot of this for the first time. So uh, if you end up going to a deferral, I, I would support that um, in general, but uh, I do remain open to it and I'd like to hear more from the rest of the board and that sort of thing as we come to a vote. Yep, thank you for, Rusty, did you have a comment okay, to I'm this just question? Gonna sure, say, thank just you. In response to one thing you said about whether you're gonna have a lot of nonprofits coming here or not, I, I, I just say this is not a new law, right? And so it's not, I mean, this, this tax exempt bonds have existed for 
you know, a long, long time, um, obviously back in the 90s and before that. So it's not, we're not doing something new here that's going to uh, open the floodgates to a whole bunch of new types of deals coming up. Yep. Any other questions or comments? All right, thank you. So a couple questions, and I appreciate my, my colleagues uh, asking asking their questions. And again, as I shared, um, in my role as chair, I certainly try to make sure that I give all of my colleagues and you know the ability to answer and, and provide comments so that we can all have a robust discussion and uh, try to make the best decision possible on how to move forward as, as a board when these kind of items come before us. So again, I, I thank my board for, for their, my fellow colleagues for their questions and comments. So a couple, couple items uh, specifically for the guests, and then maybe Josh, I have a few legal questions for you. Um, specifically for MBA, so uh, for the representative from MBA, you heard one of your, uh, it sounds like one of your alum uh, spoke during the public comment period specifically related to this matter, uh, saying that they were against this, and, and, and I'm paraphrasing, but uh, obviously spoke in opposition. Uh, what what is your what kind of response or comments do you have to that and for others that may have that same sentiment about about your school and uh, you know I, I want to say or some comments may be about not needing the money what what are your thoughts on that what's your response to that well I think if, if I understood the gentleman's comments correctly he was uh, laboring under the understanding that this money was coming from Metro to us that it was taxpayer money and it shouldn't be spent at a school like MBA or any private school. And in fact, that, as we've established, was not the case at all. This is not money coming from Metro, not a single dime coming from Metro. Money's coming from Pinnacle. It's 100% our responsibility to pay it back. Metro has no legal liability, no recourse. And so uh, if that's the concern, I think that was just a misunderstanding on his part about where this money's coming from. This isn't public financing of a, of a private school's uh, building facilities. Yep, and what about for those those individuals that may understand it's no Metro money, but but still, uh, you know, maybe see the project. It's a it's a a lot of renovations that does not it does not serve the the, the full the general public. Um, like I went to your website uh, and I saw where some it's obviously open like the and I'm speaking specifically for the fitness center. Yep. Uh, so I saw that where it's a limited right now uh, membership where some parents, I think, can buy memberships, but certainly it's limited because the school teams and the student athletes need to be able to use the facility and I guess students. So someone like me, I'm not an alumnus of, of NBA. I couldn't benefit from using the facility. Uh, somebody just randomly in that neighborhood who's not affiliated with the school could not use it. So what do you say to, to people that say, wait, this is not a good use of of uh, even this uh, this process, regardless of whether or not if the money's coming from Metro or not, what do you say to those sure. who have that who who have that stance? What's your response to that? Yeah. Well, first, I would I would disagree that these are facilities that aren't being used by other people besides those people at MBA. The, okay. Uh, the uh, um, I'll give you some examples. Um, if you had been there, for example, last Saturday, we. Uh, we have a basketball league that we have been able to start because of this new facility that gave us uh, enough gyms now to be able to do that. And we have uh, kids coming in K through six playing on basketball teams. Uh, the, the, the woman who runs this for us has told me she would, she would estimate that a third of the kids that are coming there are from non-traditional feeder schools from around Nashville um, that and they're, they're there all day long, dozens of teams, dozens of kids, K through six, that have no relationship to NBA other than that it gives them a place to play basketball. We let uh, uh, travel teams throughout the summer and other periods of time, basketball teams come in and use that facility. Uh, she's estimated that 90% of those kids are um, – from diverse backgrounds, have no connection to MBA whatsoever, but it's a place for them to come and, and their team has a place to practice when they otherwise might not be able to do that. Um, we, uh, we have a, if you'd have been last Saturday, again, if you had been there, 
we let a group come in. I think it was organized by some uh, the football coaches at TSU, or maybe they were former coaches at TSU, but they put on a seven-on-seven -seven football clinic, and there were 40 to 50 uh, boys there. I would say 90% of them were African-American young men, no more than a half a dozen of the kids, if that many, were MBA students. Um, and they were utilizing an indoor practice facility because the weather wasn't great outside. Um, all summer long, we have camps that bring in kids from around the city. Uh, some end up going to MBA, some don't. Uh, we have programs like Time to Rise, where we go out and we take at-risk youth and we bring in uh, 30 kids at a time. They get academic training. They get fed lunch, they get to play sports, they get to see what that's like, and they utilize these facilities in the summertime. We have a program called the Wilson Summer Scholar Program where we literally go out, we send a representative to 45 public schools around Nashville to look for children who, uh, who are interested in an academic outreach program, and they come in the summers and we provide them with an enrichment program from an academic standpoint. Uh, most of those kids, or many of those kids, don't end up coming to MBA, but it gives them an opportunity to do something that they might otherwise never get to do. Um, a few weeks ago, we hosted a dinner in this new facility for the Innocence Project, which is a death penalty advocacy group that needed a place to host a dinner, and we were happy to do it. So I, I, I will tell you that we, we try very hard to look for opportunities to help the community, to look for opportunities to help children, particularly who may not be in a position to know much about MBA, may not even be for that, from that part of the city, to come there and use our facilities, not just our athletic facilities, but other facilities, arts facilities, theater facilities. Um, and we look for opportunities to help the community when groups want to come and use our facilities. And so um, I would very respectfully suggest that people who say this is only for MBA uh, don't spend any time on our campus and don't understand what we do over there. That's simply not true. Thank you for thank you for providing that information. I, I did not know that, so um, I appreciate I appreciate you sharing. So, couple a couple other questions for me. Um, so, so this project is already completed. Um, let me go to, let me ask legal one question first on that. So Josh, does the fact that the project is already completed from a legal standpoint in any way impact whether this board can issue the tax exempt bonds? Uh, uh, it does not, and as for us and Bob mentioned, um, this is allowable, so there's there's no, there's nothing that precludes that from, from the board issuing the bonds. Okay, thank you. When your group considered doing this project because it's it's mostly complete, um, substantially complete, I guess would be the term to use, did why not at that time come before the board? Um, I don't know, maybe it was interest rates were higher then. Um, maybe it was timing to get the project started. I don't know, but why would why not come before? the board at that time to get the financing in place on the front end versus on the back end. You don't want that one, do you? I could give you my two cents worth. Sure. I, I'm not on the board. I wasn't privy to those discussions. I, th I think they were looking at various alternatives. Having used tax exempt financing in the past, they knew that was a likely source, but they weren't sure exactly what they wanted to use. And they knew given the IRS rule that they had the ability to reach back and so just to preserve some flexibility they they did not make a hard decision to do anything at that point i don't know that there was any any more strategy to it than that i don't know if our director of finance ms matthews knows any more about it but i mean um, that's why they passed the resolution back in april of 19 to preserve the ability to come before you all but they just at that point were not you know not sure what exactly they wanted to do long term and, you know, they didn't have to make the decision then. You know, they felt like that they would have the ability to come to you all. So that was why they waited to this point. I, I, mean, I don't, again, I don't, I don't know exactly the thinking either. Sure. But, but the part of the reason for this rule is that you don't have to, you know, if they would have been courteous. Can you, 
sorry, when you say rule, can you explain that again? Well, the, the, the reimbursement rules that allow okay. you to, to put a put a, a real resolution in place that says we we are contemplating tax exempt bonds for this. Um, is if they would have if they would have entered in come come to the board and gotten a loan, you know, in 2019, they would have obviously been paying interest on that loan for that entire period. Mm -hmm. um, and also, construction loans, you know, often look different than permanent financing do. There's you know, sure. banks lenders just have different. Um, requirements on construction projects going on, and so by able being able to do construction, have that in place, and then go only do permanent financing at the end, it saves interest and also saves some burden uh, uh, along the way. And if if I'm understanding you too, if you have a construction, just in overall speak, if you have a construction on two, then you're at some point likely transitioning that over to a a permanent loan as well. Pretty common, uh, yeah, to have a construction loan and then take it out with a permanent loan. Uh, yeah. Whereas if you have the flexibility, you do it and you just get one loan on the back end um, for yeah. flexibility. So, yeah. okay. Um, so obviously this, our board, economic development, right? So did your board, and, and when I say board, let me be clear, the board at MBA, was that a, so are you saying that was a consideration when you initiated this project uh, a couple of years ago that you would be able to potentially come before the board, this board, and potentially obtain tax exempt bonds? Was that, was that part of the, the, the thinking and was that a consideration, a factor before you initiated this project? I, I, again, I'm not on the board of trustees, but it is my understanding that yes, they looked at, they thought about, okay, w what are the different options here? What can we do in one, specific consideration was, as we've done in the past, go to the IDB, get tax exempt uh, bond financing, and what do we need to do to preserve that? IRS rule said you need to pass this resolution saying that you're preserving that right and then make sure you do it within X number of months or whatever that IRS rule is. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, that's, that is definitely something they were considering at that time. Um, it was one of the options they wanted to preserve. Thank you for that. From a economic standpoint, so again, from my research and just to, in general, just doing research on, on tax exempt bonds, et cetera, and, and why they're utilized throughout various countries, obviously it's about economic impact. That's the, that's the idea. If, if, if maybe you can do a project that maybe you wouldn't do, um, maybe you can do a project that you couldn't do because the interest rates are lower on the money you're borrowing because you know the interest to the bank is tax exempt, the interest income. Maybe you can do a project that you wouldn't normally do, or maybe you were planning to, to spend, and I'm just throwing numbers out, $20 million on a capital improvement project, but because you can get a lower interest rate from your bank if it's a tax exempt bond, maybe instead of doing 20, now you spend $35 million or more, which means maybe you hire more workers, uh, local labor, which stimulates the economy. And, and that's just me talking from my research. So for this particular project, you said it was a, sounds like a pretty extensive project. Can you speak at all to this board about, because uh, you're saying that you thought about this, that this exempt tax exempt bond was a consideration years, several, a couple of years ago on this project. So can you speak to us at all about the economic impact? I know you've talked a little bit about different organizations being able to use your facilities, but can you speak at all about any type of economic impact or generation from this project? How many workers, sure. local, any yeah. any numbers or anything yes. that you can share with this board, I, I would certainly be interested okay. in. I, I know from the application um, that, that we, I think that project employed uh, over a thousand construction workers for good period of time yeah and I think 25 contractors and I think about 95 percent of those over 1,000 employees that were can you can you repeat that one more time so I, this I, is on the application I think that the, the uh, there it, it says how many people will the project employ over 1,000 employed during construction 25 contractor employees additional subcontractors 95% of those who were employed were local local workers. So 95% of the over 1,000 were local workers, local contractors, subcontractors. And what was the uh, and what was the timeline on construction roughly? I, April of 19 through okay. what would you say December of yeah, first week of January 2021 somewhere yeah. in there. Got gotcha. you. Any other numbers 
on that impact or anything that you can that you all have? I mean, today? off the top of my head, no. But uh, you know, if, uh, I'm sure somebody okay. can go back and look at some other stuff if we. If, uh, so just to make sure I'm clear, you're saying a thousand uh, thousand jobs specifically for this construction project. This 25 says, contractors. This and, says over 1,000. I don't know okay. the exact number. It says one, over 1,000 employed during construction. And you're saying 95% local as well? Yes, okay. that's what this says. I spoke with the um, Rustfield and Gorey, who were the contractors on this, to verify the numbers uh, to, you know, and just ask them how many people were employed on the project and just to get a little a little bit of detail. So that's that's what they verified for us. They tracked that, so I feel real comfortable with these numbers. Okay. Thank, thank you for sharing. Sure. Um, and I don't know if that includes, I have no idea when it talks about construction, if that includes, for example, architects and other I things. I would say not. We employed uh, Hastings Architect Architecture Company, which is a local company, and they, they're the ones that did the building, and there were many, many of their employees involved in this for a long period of time. Okay. Uh, thank you for sharing that. Uh, Josh, a couple of legal questions for you just before we get into the actual document. Um, so, Josh, from a legal perspective, again, uh, the fact that it's reimbursement, does that has, has no bearings. Um, um, because this, and, and again, this board, people can vote how they want, but is there any, has there been a precedence? Obviously, legally, this is within the board statute. Um, for, for these types of organizations to come before us legally because in the past there's been schools that have been approved, there's been amendments approved by other schools and other organizations with the same status. Is, has there been any precedent that has been set um, because of that, in your legal opinion? You mean for this board to approve similar type projects in the future? I mean, obviously, if the board's done it in the past, um, obviously, you can continue to do it. I don't know if it's necessarily meaning that it's a, a precedent, and I think the way I understand, okay. it, understand you to mean it. But, I mean, obviously, as you mentioned, the, the statute says you can do it. It's actually in the charter for the IDV that you're able to do this for, for schools. So um, it, it, you certainly have the authority to do it. Thank you for that. And then one final question for the group, and then we'll, we'll move, uh, keep moving forward. From a timing standpoint, so you came before us, and there's been some questions about coming before this board. You've answered that, uh, and, and we've all discussed that NBA has been before this board before. Uh, just from a timing standpoint, um, obviously you, you do the application um, from a. And again, I, I just I always want to give our any anyone that comes before us uh, just try to understand the process because time has been talked about a lot. So. We have a general timeline of, of how this came together, but from a timing standpoint, um, why was, so a couple questions. One, why was now the time? Um, and that may be for NBA or Russ, but two, um, obviously we had a meeting coming up because we typically meet now on the third Wednesday um, of the month. Um, why was it, from, from your standpoint, why was the timing so important to come at this meeting? And from a timing standpoint, if, if you did not, if this were not approved, let's say today, and, and again, I, I don't know what will happen, but if it were not approved, is what is the risk or um, uncertainty if, if, if people on this board say, well, we can wait till March or April, if any, is, are there really truly any time constraints? Uh, that is really what I'm trying to, to ask here. Um, as far as why we came to this meeting versus uh, another meeting, I, I think one issue uh, that we talked about is, the reimbursement period is, is starting to roll off. And so that, that was what prompted the um, let's get this rolling. Can, and uh, yeah. I'm sorry, I don't want to, but sure. can you explain the reimbursement just kind of high level again on yeah. what you mean by um, that? So, so basically under the reimbursement rules, you've got, um, you, you have to re start reimbursing your, or you have to, you have the ability to reimburse yourself for expenditures going three years, up to three years ago. And so they started incurring some expenditures three years ago. Um, now, as the vice chair pointed out, there, there are lots of expenditures here, so I'm not sure that's a, a real driver of the time. I think the big issue is um, just interest rates, and they're, they're volatile right now. And so, um, you know, this is a 30-year fixed rate deal, and, and they want to lock it in at the, at the lowest rate that they can. Um, and so that was, that was the decision to go 
to um, you know the, the students meeting we could go to. Gotcha. Uh, anybody from MBI, do you have any response to that or anything? Um, yeah, the, he was asking how long is the Pinnacle rate locked, and Pinnacle has quoted a rate to them. I, I, I think that is, I believe it's, I believe it would be into March. Um, I don't know exactly how far into March it is, but. Um, that, that would be the only thing, I, the only concern I would have, and I don't know the answer. And I, so I, it could, and again, interest rates depend on what they are, which again, that's not necessarily this board's issue, but that's the reason for the timing on, on your end. Um, Okay. When we, uh, can I say something? Sure. When we started um, sort of getting close to doing this and talking with all of the um, the various institutions who sent proposals to us, uh, we narrowed it down to Pinnacle, and I say we, the board, not myself. Uh, one of the um, issues that we discussed is that we would do our best, you know, using good faith to close by the end of February. Uh -huh. That was okay. sort of the commitment that our board finance mm -hmm. committee made with <clears throat> Pinnacle Bank that we would in good faith do everything we could to close by the end of February. So I guess the answer to maybe the feelings of we're trying to hurry up, you know, we're trying to honor our commitment to our lender and that that's really all it is. So. Yeah. I understood and certainly uh, you answered the question until you said from your perspective, look, I mean, the reason you come before this is obviously the whole idea behind this is to get a lower interest rate. Yes, sir. Um, you know, so if interest rates are potentially going to rise, then it benefits anyone if they're trying to finance anything to get it locked in sooner. So right. I, I just want to ask the question from a timeline perspective to understand what 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 brought this on. Um, OK, uh, general question, I, I would ask Courtney and your experience in general, because obviously Again, I, 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 this has been great for, I think today it's been a, a good discussion, just learning experience for us, um, for our board. But Courtney, in your experience, obviously you've done this in uh, Austin, et cetera. Do you see these, in your experience, have you seen these utilized? Um, and also, have you seen it utilized for, uh, obviously we've talked about the YMCA, but have you seen this utilized for schools as well in education in your experience? Um, yeah, I mean, I've done a number of private activity bonds for nonprofits. I've done them for empowerment zones. I've um, financed industrial facilities. Um, you know, I, I think some of the points that Quinn brought up, the policies. Um, you look at some of our peer cities within Tennessee. Uh, I think this body and I told you yesterday we got to revamp our policies for this, this body. Um, there's no penalty to NBA. They're following the current procedures. And technically, we don't have a policy as it relates to bonds or pilots or how we do TIFs. And of course, we look at these programs that we have. Our peer cities in Tennessee of Chattanooga and Memphis and Knoxville all charge fees uh, well above and what we're charging now. It is an antiquated application. And if you look at the application right now, it actually says Mayor Carl Dean. Um, that's, that's what our fee was said. Yes. So it, it needs to be revamped. And like I said, there's no penalty to the NBA. You are following the current procedure in place. Yes, sir. And so as we move forward, and we'll talk about this a little later, if we have time today, about how we compare to some of our peer cities that relates to economic development. Um, our policies, especially this body, and how we look at um, other cities around the country and how to utilize the toolbox for economic development. And so um, utilizing private activity bonds, in this case, for a nonprofit, is within the statute of 1986 Tax Reform Act, and it's also within the statute for the state of Tennessee. It is in our current policy to allow this institution to apply for this program. Now, if there's some outcomes in what our peer cities may do, they take those fees and finance other activities. Well, $750 is not gonna do a lot for anybody as far as what the application fee is. And that's, like I said, no penalty to them. That's really something as a body, as a metropolitan area, we need to revamp and look at and that's why you saw a few weeks ago 
um, council set aside some capital to actually do our first economic development plan for Metropolitan Nashville, which we will talk about these things and have this body engaged and look at ways to best utilize economic development and what is the right tool. Right now, within the current policies, well, if it's not a policy, with the actual current bylaws of this body, <clears throat> within Tennessee statute, within the federal statute, this is allowable. Now, if this, if this body, within its retreat or other programs, want to look at ways to restrict transactions like this or charge a, a fee, which then utilize for equitable and inclusive economic development, then that's his prerogative. But right now, that is not in place. We have to work with what's in place right now. Yeah, thank you, thank you for that. And certainly, I think there's it, it coincides with some other things that that we're working on on this board that that per, it, it pertain to a larger discussion on that. But um, I thank you for sharing your background. I, I just want to ask you because of your experience in economic development, how common this was, and it you've, it it is, and certainly within in this board's uh, statute, and we have to live in you know, what we have currently in, in the current policy and statutes that we have. So I, I appreciate your perspective on that. That was that was very helpful to me just to understand the C. And again, uh, because we don't have a lot of uh, organizations like this that have come before us, uh, you know, lately, j just want to get as much information for, for myself and my colleagues as well. So, all right, with that, and, and specifically staying on, on the topic on, on this agenda item, uh, this board received the, the documents last week uh, related to the bond issuance. Uh, Bob, if you will, just very, very high level, and, and obviously we're, uh, from a timing standpoint, uh, we're fine, but if you will, high level, just give us an overview of the documents, um, just like we typically would. And uh, I don't think there's anything different specific with these documents versus other bond deals, but if there is, please highlight that for the group. Uh, I would just like to say that it's a very standard, and this, this is by no means a desire to be to belittle. It's, it's very excellent in that it is a very standard bond purchase agreement that uh, calls for this refinancing and has the kinds of provisions within it that uh, one would expect to see. And it's frankly been done by a firm and a particular attorney who knows a lot about how to do it. And it was also done uh, on behalf of a bank that is into this, uh, Pinnacle Bank is. I'm not advertising for them, it's just the, the observation, and I think most of you know that. Um, the other thing I would like to say is that the resolution that was presented states within it the things that we like to see in resolutions, which say that the officers of the issuer are exempt, that grants the ability of uh, the issuer's officers to do what they need to do in order to make this particular financing occur. So not only is the bond purchase agreement uh, properly done, and, uh, and will work and will, by its own terms, make sure that the Industrial Development Board has no liability whatsoever and that the members of the board, of course, therefore, have no liability whatsoever and that there's no Metro funding, as you've heard over and again uh, in this meeting. Uh, but the resolution tracks that as well. So. If this were to be done, this would be a good time to do it. Just, I mean, that's a lawyer speaking now, not a board member. Yeah, so in your, you represent us, you're our bond cash right. counsel. So in your legal opinion, if this board did decide to move forward, in your legal opinion, are these documents, like we always ask, or, you know, from your legal opinion, are these documents suitable and in, in approvable form for this board with no liability? They're if this board wanted to do they're that. They're suitable. They're appropriate, and there's no liability. Okay. Thank you for that. Uh, 
Josh's Metro Council, uh, anything else you'd like to add to that related to from a legal perspective on these documents? No, I, I just would concur with what Bob said. Um, again, I think the key point, at least for this board and for Metro just generally, is just the fact that there are no recourse um, to, to Metro or to the IDB if there's any default on the obligations on these bonds. And the resolution and the BPA, the bond purchase agreement, states those things. So I think everything's in order. Can I just make a follow-up comment real quick? Um, I, I think MBA has met its fiduciary duty, and I think you have in good faith gotten this before us. And what I would just like to make the distinction here is that just because you, your board has a fiduciary duty and you agree to terms with Pinnacle, which, again, you've satisfied to the best of your ability, doesn't mean that we have a duty to Pinnacle doesn't mean that we have a duty as trustees at MBA. And given what we know about the full budget and, and how long your clock is ticking, we as a board should not feel pressure to act today because if we don't act, there's still gonna be a big pot of cash that you can recoup back. And with all due respect, even though interest rates are shifting rapidly, they're not shifting so rapidly that it's going to make a huge difference for a school that has an endowment of over $70 million that just recently received a bequest of over $90 million. And while I appreciate everything MBA does for the community, MBA's been doing that. And so to say that you need this money right now to do that doesn't seem fully accurate. What I would encourage my board members my fellow board members to consider is that we defer this, and I'm going to make a motion to do so, that at our next meeting we take up a resolution to look at our fees and to revamp those fees and also begin negotiations with Metro to enter into an intergovernmental agreement so we make sure that when we're doing deals like this, we're compensating Metro for its time. Because if we pass this today and if we approve this resolution, what we're saying is that Metro Legal and ECD and the IDB have no value in actual time spent, and there's no lost opportunity cost as a result of doing this. Because right now, our fees aren't paying for that. Thank you for your, for your comments. Before we, uh, did you, any, question, any final words from our guest here? Any comments to that? No, and I, and I apologize if you thought I was saying we had we have to have this money to do those things. That's not. I was simply making the point that to the extent some of the things I've I've, I've read on on uh, in, the, in the media and whatnot suggest that this is all for the benefit of MBA. I don't think that's 100 percent accurate because there are a lot of community groups and a lot of kids around this city that make use of our facilities and will continue to do so. And we've been able to increase that because of this particular project. Yes, and thank you for, for the comment. So before we move forward, I just want to make sure. So I had Bob, as we typically do, give us some uh, information about specifically related to the documents. Uh, and obviously, we have Metro Legal as well. Are there any questions from any of my board? I'll start here to the right. Are there any specific questions related to the bond documents? For, from a legal perspective? No. If you, anything? Anything here to my, to my left? Questions related to the, legal questions related to the documents specifically? I don't have any legal questions. I just, I wanted to, Robert's but, rule point of order was, did the vice chair make a motion? I didn't, to, yeah, I didn't know if there was a motion. No, I have not made a motion yet, because I think we're I thought that's what you were doing. No, we're still in discussion. I'm happy Don't. to if you just want to cut it off, but I figure people might still have questions. Yeah, I, absolutely. I just want to make sure if I had questions, so, so yeah, thank that, you. I'm just making sure that's not what I heard, so yeah, I'm, okay. I have no questions. Okay. Well, all right, so with, with that said, we've, we've had a... I hit the button three times. I have to be careful about that. Uh, we've had a had a discussion, robust discussion here today. Uh, so I thank everyone. A couple items I would just uh, ask the, the board to just consider. Uh, number one, um, obviously the, the current policy is one that we have in place. Um, 
this board has done these types of, uh, deal, has approved these types of items in the past. It is part of our statute. Um, and if, if we want to have more discussion, that's fine. Uh, about a bigger policy issue, we certainly need to do that. But um, if people come before us uh, under a certain policy, that's what we have in place. So I just ask the board to consider that. And certainly consider too, uh, there's a lot of, uh, there's certainly options, but um, if we're going to, uh, if the thinking is let's, let's hope, uh, let's just make sure that we're always considering, you know, if we're gonna postpone something that we're going to gain additional information and not just, not just doing that for the sake of, the sake of, so. Um, anyway, I've, I've appreciated all my colleagues and, uh, so, with that said, uh, I'll entertain a motion related to to this item. Um, I'm, I'm going to move to defer. Okay. I sent a resolution to Courtney, Josh, and Bob that would allow us as a board to set fee policies and to begin negotiations on that intergovernmental agreement. And I don't think it's right to deal with this deal today given that this is a new type of deal for this board until we get that fee structure and that agreement in place. So we have a motion to defer to this item on the agenda. Do we have a second? Second with a, and I'll make a comment whenever. Go ahead. Um, yeah, I mean, to me, I, I, just based on this discussion, I'm good with a deferral of one meeting, um, if that's what you're proposing. Um, yeah, I think let's stop, can I stop you right there? Yeah, sure. Are you deferral for one meeting? Just to clarify that. Um, I, or I'm, Josh, do we need to? I think there was some question when our next meeting is, and the question is, can we get a piece? My, my question to the board would be, can we, can when we can get we? Fee set by one meeting? Josh, just for, uh, for, for purposes, uh, do we need to have a specific deferral for one meeting? Um, yeah, I think for the motion, you need to be specific as to when you're deferring to. I, I, then I would defer it out two meetings so that we can address fees in one meeting and then revisit this after it. If I may, Mr. Chair, just two, just one thing on the on the fee issue. I, I don't know if we'll be able to change the fee as it relates to this project. I mean, I'll see if the board wants to set policy going forward about fees. Um, you can certainly do that, but I mean, they've, they've paid the fee and they're now currently before the board, so I don't think we'll be able to retroactively apply that. So. Josh, I think my question to you would be, uh -huh. um, if we're not closed, how is the deal final? And additionally, as NBA may not know, because y'all aren't generally out in the business of doing economic development, but this board tries really hard to follow the council and the mayor's office desires with respect to the do better bill and to getting information out there and we routinely have companies give us information they're not required to so that we can <coughs> have as much information as possible in the public discourse and they agree to do things that they don't have to do and so my question to MBA which you don't have to answer today but that I would posit is even if we can't force the fees on this deal is MBA going to agree to abide by whatever fee structure we have out there since we haven't closed on the deal? Uh, that's a question that would have to be presented to somebody, somebody else. I, I, I would only point out what I think council is suggesting. It's it's a little bit like an ex post facto law. You, you kind of kind of moving the goalposts. Um, on, I'm on not us. sure that's what that means, but also uh, we still haven't closed the deal. So I'm not sure why council thinks the terms are final. Well, I mean, so the, the way the process works is, is obviously if anyone wants to apply before the board to make these, to make basically make this request for a conduit financing, they, they pay the fee, which they've done, they've made the application, and it's now currently before the board. So I think at this point to now say that we're going to charge you extra, I, I don't think that's in the spirit of the requirements. I mean, again, if you want to go forward saying we want to revamp our, our fee structure, I think that's completely fine, but to sort of do it retroactively, I don't think that would be permissible. I, I guess I'm still confused, just from a legal standpoint, how it's retroactive if the terms of the deal aren't final. 
Well, I, I guess I guess we're, we're maybe there's some confusion on what you mean by fee. I mean, the, the, the fee that they are paying is just to make the application for the C board. Correct. And I think that this board should consider issuance fees or annual fees or other fees that would be assessed at the time of closing. So I would think anything that's not related to the application itself is not final. <clears throat> It's an interesting point. I, to your point, I would probably need to look at that. But I, I think at this moment, I, I think if you were talking about the initial fee that you've established, which is the seven fifty, you've charged that. You now want to change it later. I, it, it seems to me that that would be problematic. But you do raise an excellent point, so I would need to do some more research on that. Yeah, I appreciate that, and I do think if you've paid an application fee and filed an application, we can't then charge you more for an application you've already filed. But that doesn't mean that that's the only fee related to a bond issue. So you're, you're talking about other fees in addition to the application. Correct. Fee. Gotcha. Okay. So Josh, just to just to clarify, in your legal opinion. If we were to defer this, uh, there's a motion on the table to defer um, legally, even if we change our structure, you're saying the application fee for MBA would not change because this is the current policy in place. Is that right? That is correct with respect okay. to the application fee, but as I understand Madam Vice Chair, she's talking about charging additional fees, and that actually might be a conversation I need to have with Bob about what additional fees can be charged. Understood. But okay. So there's there's a motion on the table to defer, um, and let's, and Josh, I think you did say it, and let me confirm correct, we do need specific timing on that? You do. Chair, okay. Um, uh, can I suggest a one meeting deferral just because if the vice chair is agreeable to that, that's what I thought I was seconding because we can always just quickly defer it again. You know, it just would keep it on the agenda. And the reason, and just as the, my comment on what I was seconding was more a deferral just because of the reasons of it moving fast and, you know, okay. just having more time. I wasn't necessarily as worried about the fees. I think we need to look at our overall fee structure. And I do think that's. That's a of bigger conversation. Is, is, a, sure. is a great point. If they've paid their application or they're they're paying their application, fair enough. For me, a one meeting deferral was what I think we. My opinion is we should do just because you could also just defer it again, but it would keep it on the agenda, and then it would give us a little more time to kind of soak all this information in, and then we can figure out process moving. Let forward. me go but to Vice Chair Segal. So. Board Member Davis thought it was a one meeting deferral. Do you want to clear? Are you fine with that? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so one one meeting deferral. So we had we had a motion to defer this item for one meeting by Board Member Segal, properly seconded by Board Member Davis. Is there any further discussion on that deferral? All right. All those of all those in favor, say aye. 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 Okay. Any opposed? All right, motion motion carried. So this uh, for this motion carried for a one meeting deferral. So thank you everyone for for your time, and uh, we'll we'll see you at our next our next meeting. So thank you. When is that next meeting? If I might ask, is that on uh, the calendar we, already? We're we're going to talk about we're about to talk about that here okay, shortly. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. All right, thank you. Uh, next item on the agenda was. Uh, the mayor's office of economic and community development to talk about uh, economic development strategy overview talk about where we've been where we're going on timing we're at noon now um, what do you want to pr proceed uh, i'll defer to the board do we want to proceed with that or push this to the next meeting due to time we're at 12 o'clock i think right now Yeah, this is. That's my only concern with pushing it off. Yes, um, and this is more. This is part of this is, uh, and board member Segal, Part of this too was just kind of an intro to economic development yeah. because we have new board members. Um, so I'll defer to everybody. Are we good on time? We're at twelve o'clock. I'm good till one o'clock, but I do would like uh, like a five minute break. Um, Josh, do I need to do anything to do I? What do I need to do from a legal perspective? People need to take a quick break. You can just say we're taking a break. All right, we're going we're to take a five-minute five break and, and regroup. Thank you.
we'll go ahead and reconvene the meeting. And we were on item number B, Mayor's Office of Economic and Development. And we have Courtney Polk, Director of ECD, to talk with us about uh, strategy and developing a strategy moving forward and provide us with updates. So, Courtney, with that, I'll turn it over to you. And I think there's a presentation on our monitors. Sure. Um, before you, I'm uh, going to talk about economic development here at Metro Nashville and the structure we currently have. And our current toolbox via this body, the Industrial Development Board, and um, the things we've done and how we compare to other IDBs around the state of Tennessee. And so in a general sense, when we talk about economic development, I, I think there's a lot of definitions out there. But being a board member of IEDC, the International Economic Development Council, uh, this is a standard definition, which it's a program or group of policies that seek to improve the well-being and quality of life for a community uh, by creating and retaining jobs uh, that facilitate the growth of the community and stabilize the tax base. That is the general definition of economic development. Uh, you have heard a lot of people define economic development, but this is the actual definition of what it is and what it should be doing. And, and how you do economic development is basically four buckets we look at. You look at the small business entrepreneurship component. We got the business attraction retention co component. Then there's workforce. Then there's development redevelopment. So those really are the four main buckets of economic development and how we go about performing those tasks um, to make sure we're providing a quality of life um, for our various community. Here in the IDB, um, it's all about the partnerships in Nashville ECD, um, working with our various partners from the chamber to the state to Tennessee Valley Authority course you, the IDB, MDHA, Metro Department of Housing Authority, uh, GNRC, various other Metro departments, uh, Nashville Business Incubation Center, the Nashville Entrepreneurship Center, and of course, Metro Ac Action Commission. And these are really our various partners to make sure um, they help us perform economic development. Now, the toolbox that lies within this body uh, that are utilized to perform the task of economic development. We have pilots or payment in lieu of taxes, various cash grants you have approved historically via this body, um, some small business incentives. This body can do TIFs. It's done basically one or two. Um, and also infrastructure support. And of course, the uh, very lengthy and robust debate about private activity bonds being industrial industrial development bonds, but also uh, 501c3 bonds. So pilots is just another tool, really a tax abatement in which the IDB assumes ownership of that asset. And as it assumes ownership of that asset, the entity that enters into agreement with us can do an abatement over a period of time, uh, reducing the actual um, abatement percentage for the actual um, project. Um, there's a various agreement put in place over a period of time. There's a security interest put on the property. And there's a lease transaction put in place to actually um, create that pilot or payment in lieu of taxes structure for the various corporations that apply to the Industrial Development Board. And that goes through the approval process. They file an application, come before this body, uh, work with Metro Council to get the actual approval. So the current pilots we have in place is one with Keystone, one with Ryman, uh, Community Health Systems, uh, Bridgestone, LifePoint, Dale, and the Health Spring. And they have various time frames. Um, some are five years, and actually one goes for 40 years at 100%. Um, what I kind of realized, if you go around in doing pilots and having some experience of that, one of the things we may want to look at 
going forward is how do we structure these deals? Uh, what is the actual economic impact of these transactions? Uh, what is the actual feasibility of these transactions to the Metro government and to the overall IDB? I think some of the questions we all I'm hearing from this body is what is the overall impact of these transactions? There's really no means in place to actually assess that, such as a model to kind of show what is a presentation done by a company applying for incentives. How do we look at that? Another thing I wanted to point out also is that we look at you know some of our peer cities around Tennessee. You know, for application fee, I, I, I looked online within our own toolbox. I didn't see an actual application fee for pilots from this body. Now, if you go to MDHA, they actually have a, a fee, 10% uh, of the actual increment or savings goes back to MDHA. But we look at some of our peer cities that are IDBs or have IDBs. Memphis, they have a, a $3,000 application fee. They also charge a, a five percent of the tax savings up to uh, three hundred thousand dollars to um, support economic development. And they also have a called an inner city fee, tied back to the city of Memphis or Shelby County, and that goes up to fifty thousand dollars. If that quote unquote abatement is transferred over a period of time, there's also a fee for that. And the, applicant, the applicant is actually responsible for bond counsel and so on. Uh, Chattanooga charges the same thing, a 5% of the tax savings. Uh, Knoxville charges a application fee between two and $4,000. Um, they also take 5% of the tax savings. And they charge a fee for transferring the actual abatement up to 1%. Um, both Memphis and Knoxville uh, put in place a scoring system quality of jobs, living wages, uh, community impact tied to it, local hiring initiatives. Um, I think Knoxville has an environmental requirement tied to their application. So um, our application process is pretty much uh, case by case. So it's subjective. Um, that's probably not the best thing to do if you want to have a very structured process. So whenever someone comes to this body, they kind of know what they're applying for and they know the procedures, what they're getting into. Right now, that's not set up that way. Cash grants. Uh, this body has approved a number of cash grants uh, geared toward corporate headquarters and technology firms, um, international in a sense, or regional headquarters. Um, Typically, the companies must, based on the statute, must create 500 jobs during the first five years of operation or expansion. And for every job created, uh, they can get an incentive of $500 per job. And that goes through this approval process by filing application to this body. So some of the cash grants that are currently in place, there's Water Music, um, there's Bridgestone, there's Dale, there's Phillips, which came before this body back in August. Um, it's currently outstanding. There's Amazon and Alliance Bernstein. They have not collected their cash grants, but in their future they will. And Corden, just to clarify, is that because they have not started their clock per se? They haven't started the clock. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. So Amazon's, I think, $17.5 million. Alliance Bernstein is basically uh, $3.6 million. We, um, by statute, you have some small business tools in place. Um, that comes from Metro Council providing capital to support those programs. Um, they are done in two components um, for fast growing businesses that have fewer than 100 employees and that add 10 or more jobs in a 12 month period. Then there's a one-time uh, $500 per job grant, which goes up to $750 for veterans. And there's a blighted property grant program, which um, can be utilized for tier one census tracts that have high, uh, low to moderate income data tied to them uh, for properties less than a million dollars. And then it's developer or real estate uh, puts um, 
$100,000 in the project. These two buckets of programs, one is funded, one is not funded. Um, the blighted property grant program is unfunded. Um, and for the fast growing small business program, uh, there's roughly about $150,000 there. Um, I think historically we had a roughly about $200,000 put in place. Um, right now it's about 150. Uh, like I said, the property grant program, a blighted property grant program, there's no money there for that program as of now. So we're not offering that program through lack of funding. Tips or tax increment financing, it's a pledge of future property tax revenues. To secure financing for a project, the IDB has that authority. Uh, we have issued a number of TIFs going forward. We actually did one, and Oracle is a semi-TIF program. Um, so we can utilize the increment to pay for or support a proposed project and take the future stream of payments over a period of time which should then be monetized to provide capital upfront for that project. Um, TIFs can be utilized for convention centers or tourism, uh, community redevelopment projects, MDHA. Um, the only item that's really required by this body is a economic impact plan. Uh, those who that were here for Oracle, um, you saw the um, report which has all the indicators about um, what is the actual impact to Davidson County, um, tied to job creation, capital investment? Uh, what is the actual multiplier of this project? In the case of Oracle, there's a base of 8,500 jobs. There's a multiplier effect of creating additional jobs from that tied to the various industries and the overall impact of that project. So uh, that's required by statute to have a um, economic impact plan when a TIF request comes to this body um, to get it approved. So that's the only real difference. There's not really a requirement for a redevelopment plan, but it really does require an economic impact plan to really uh, get approval from this body. So as I stated before, Metro Council approves the, or the IDB approves the economic impact plan from there, Metro Council approves it, much like you saw with the Oracle transaction. And then developer secures financing and they can go to the market and do a structure, what they call senior subordinate structure. We have a senior debt instrument. They have subordinate debt instrument tied to the actual increment for a project. Uh, that money is then utilized to go back into the project to support the actual development. Then you have the actual financing plan, which talks about how the money would be utilized. And we have basically done two transactions, Bellevue Mall redevelopment in the Oracle, um, utilizing this process. And question for you, Courtney, on, on that. Do you and how often were, and obviously we haven't done a lot of TIFs on this board. I, I was on the board when we did the Bellevue Mall, uh, which several years ago, which has really transformed that area. Um, and I think he grew up in Bellevue um, with the Prince facility and everything. Do you, is was that, do you think that's something in this in this part of your plan that is something that, that should be like pushed more um, as, as just a tool in, in the toolbox to utilize and how often was it used in your other positions? The TIF. <laughs> from Chicago. <laughs> do you know how many TIFs in Chicago? <laughs> There's 180 TIF districts in Chicago. You have nine. You have nine. Gotcha. I created 20 by myself. <laughs> um, also, in Dallas, I managed 21 TIF districts. Um, yeah. And most of the TIFs here have been done by MDHA, mm -hmm. um, except for the um, Bellevue Mall a redevelopment um, project and then um, Oracle. So I am very familiar with the TIF process. Um, you know, I help um, look at the statute, state of Illinois, and revamped that and a couple of times, uh, revamped that for the county. Cook County has um, taken 180 TIF districts in Cook County. There is over 430 TIF districts in Cook County. So it was my job to oversee all the, we call the joint review board meetings 
Uh, what that entails, when a TIF is created, there is various taxing bodies that must come together to agree to create the TIF district, uh, from schools, fire, police, library, mosquito abatement districts. Um, there's basically between 10 and 15 levies on Cook County tax bill. That's why you have a lot of people moving here. Um, <laughs> but um, yeah, that's a very involved process. Um, there's a number of steps that were in, that need to be adhered to to secure a TIF financing. I've also, on the back end, worked in monetizing the actual TIF obligations for the bank or doing a bond deal or take, doing a private placement for a transaction. So I'm very familiar with the TIF process. I think as we look at our tools for economic development, that comes back to having policies and a plan in place. Overall, there's a regional plan in the sense of national, the chamber. Um, what is our local plan for Davidson County and Nashville? And how do we best utilize this body to leverage its authority to foster economic development? What are the right tools? What is the right structure? Is it a small business? Are you want to model yourselves after Edge in Memphis? Or are you want to model yourself after Knoxville, which is a different structure? It's really about, you know, all this coming together. The various partners that make up our economic development apparatus look at how we structure the best, best way of providing the service of economic development, which benefits all Nashvillians. Right now, it's kind of fragmented in the sense that if I start a small business, who, who would I go to? Do I come here? If I come here, what is the actual application process? It's not very clear online. It's where it's not existing online. If I file an application, what is the fee? There are no fees. <laughs> um, if you look at, you know, we want to benefit and talk about inclusion and equity, uh, where is our programming tied to local hiring initiatives or wage floors in the sense of if we're providing incentives, we want to make sure that we're hiring locally. We want to make sure that we're providing the right wages, which our other peer cities in Tennessee do. We don't do that just now. And so that's something we need to look at. And also, it's, you know, for example, when some of the other cities create a TIF, to say Memphis, they charge $3,000, a $3,000 application fee. They also pay between 3 and 10% back to the city or back to the body being edge. They also limit the amount of increment going to a project between 50 and 75% 75 in increment uh, tied to the project. And there's also a local hiring requirement, a local business support requirement of 28%. So if it's a project, they requiring require 28% of the businesses from Memphis or Shelby County to be engaged with that project. Uh, Corey, sorry, I just want to make sure I understand. You said they charge between 3 and 10%. Is that of, like, the issuance cost? That's administration fee. In so three. Okay. Three to ten percent of the actual increment. So if it's hundred thousand dollars of increment per year, they take three percent of that goes back to Edge, okay. the IDB. Thank you. Uh, Two percent goes to Shelby County. Uh, up to four percent goes to Memphis. Then a one percent goes to the city treasurer. And this is for tax increment deals. Yeah. Tips, yes. Yes. Yeah. That's not, that's a lot more than. And they limit the amount of increment that goes to a project between fifty and seventy five percent. Okay. Thank you. Then you look at Knoxville charges $10,000 for application. Um, they charge a 0.25% administrative fee annually. And they also limit the amount of increment that goes to the project between 60% and 75%. Courtney, do any of these places, um, and I know I could look it up, but I think it's probably helpful for everybody. To your knowledge, do any of them distinguish between the type of projects? So, for example, like... Uh, would they have lower fees for low-income housing mm -hmm. deals than maybe for, I mean, private school is the example that comes to mind, but something that's not affordable housing. Yes. I mean, I, I think there's there's various areas they want to focus on. So say, for example, Memphis has a number of pilots. Um, they have pilots for community impact. There's a retention pilot. Um, there's an expansion pilot. Um, there's a pilot for sewer and water. There's a pilot for job attraction. 
So there's multiple components of segways of pilots. So for example, the community impact pilot, they remove some of those requirements because they want to foster investment in those various areas of the city that are underinvested. Okay. Much like we have here. Yeah, great. Thank but you. But we, we don't have a focus of where we want to right. place our incentives, where we want to encourage or catalyze investment in these corridors. Okay. That's something we have to look at as we kind of create this plan for economic development. That's where we're missing because right now is we're not very focused. I think we're getting there, but it's kind of got to build the box and have the narrative and go through the process of building out this plan over the next nine to 12 months. Um, infrastructure support. So Metro has paid the a portion of the infrastructure, infrastructure costs um, that a, a developer would normally pay, uh, be required to pay for infrastructure. Um, it must be public infrastructure. Um, it's typically done through a shared agreement, and like some of the projects you have, this body's approved is the Lifeway project um, some time ago, and it must go through our Metro Council for approval. There's a few of those out there between one or two of these transactions, um, but it is one of our tools in the toolbox. And of course, private activity bonds. So by statute, this body can't issue Taxes and bonds, or you can do taxable bonds. It depends on the transaction. Um, and those bonds can be utilized for qualified projects under the uh, 1986 Tax Reform Act, uh, which basically creates that structure um, and requirements for issuing private activity bonds. Um, in comparing some of the places around Tennessee that issue private activity bonds, um, we charge a fee of $750, uh, $750. Um, Memphis charges a fee of $2,000 plus. Uh, baseline application fee, uh, Knoxville charges $500. There's a filing fee in Memphis of, of additional $2,000. Uh, Knoxville charges basically um, 10 basis points or 0.10%, of the total bond issue for a project. So in that case, um, let's take $10 million, it's about, um, about $10,000 roughly. Um, there's also a closing fee in Memphis. We should pay a half a point for anything less than, start with $1 million, and up to um, uh, 15 basis points, and they over a million dollars. So you start with a baseline of a million dollars, you pay a half a percent, and then above that, they pay 1.15% 1 1.15% above that for anything above a million dollars. Um, this bond council fees that goes up to $18,000 plus one basis point. And for extensions for a project uh, in Memphis, you pay um, for the inducement ordinance, which basically is a placeholder ordinance. Uh, there's a, if there's a need for an extension, they pay additional $500 if there's an extension needed for the actual issuance resolution, that's another $500. So there's a series of fees that take place. In Knoxville, if you want to call a special meeting, that's $5,000. That goes back to the Industrial Development Board. Um, there's another $1,000 for um, pay for placeholding also the bonds. Um, the only fee I found for us is $750. So, and typically those fees are utilized for I know the person in Knoxville reached out to me and asked me, um, do you guys charge fees? Like, well, not really. Um, and, and I have that conversation. Um, they utilize their fees to support small businesses. Uh, a lot of development authorities or IDBs around the country we utilize those fees for board training, uh, marketing, but also um, supporting small businesses. So you create a revolving loan fund. Um, you can do cash grants. Um, you can do a facade rebate program. There was a number of things that other cities have done with those fees. So it does not city there in a, in a, in a box. Uh, when I worked in Georgia, we bought an apartment complex um, to help rehab the apartment complex. 
We also launch a small business program to attract a grocery store to an underserved area of, of Clayton County, Georgia. And so there are very creative, very creative ways to kind of leverage that. Um, that's something that I think this body in Metro uh, will need to sit down and kind of talk about as we kind of frame out our strategy for economic development. All right. So, um, as you may have heard, there was a um, approval or capital to get our first strategy for economic development in place. Um, like I said, we have a metro or area-wide plan for economic development, but this will be the first time we'll actually create our plan for Nashville. And so the goal of the plan is really to have a strategy that talks about Nashville and building an economy that works for all Nashvilleans and that makes a comp our city competitive with our peer cities around the country and gives us a template for a plan in which people could look at over the next five to ten years um, to assess the things they want to see within their communities, if it's workforce development, is it a new grocery store, is it job creation, uh, that's the overall benefit of creating a plan at the local level. And so we want to make sure that we have a very competitive city, but also build a, an economy that is equitable and inclusive for all Nashvilleans. So in looking at some of our pure cities and how they look at ECD, you know, we're very limited in our resources at ECD. Uh, you look at some of our pure cities of Atlanta, that has a Metro Atlanta chamber, that has a local level, Vest Atlanta, which is a quasi entity between the city and they utilize the Georgia Development Authority law, which is very similar to the IDB law here in Tennessee. That is funded, funded through both a public source and a private source. They have roughly about $13 million. Denver is, is pretty much the same structure we have here in government uh, they provide between, they provide basically $9.4 million of general fund dollars to support ECD or economic development. Charlotte, the same way, uh, 6.4. Uh, Seattle, basically about the same population we have here in metropolitan Nashville. They uh, allocate 14.6. Dallas oversaw that, the operational budget in Dallas is 8.3. Now, I did have a capital budget managing the TIFs and the public improvement districts, and that was another $100 million a year that I managed. We also collected fees off of that to support economic development. So revolving loan fund, going out and doing corporate attraction, bringing grocery stores to underserved markets, supporting entrepreneurs, supporting small businesses with a, um, grant cash grants, all those things kind of fell in my purview. Um, here in Nashville, um, taking consideration what goes to the chamber and what we provide to some of our partners at MBIC or NEC, uh, we're about uh, $600,000. Um, I don't know what to say, but... <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I, I think the picture says it all. <laughs> I think we want to be, if we want to have a competitive city, we want to talk about inclusion, we want to talk about equity, we kind of got to relook at economic development, how it's structured. I think our partners, you know, our, every city has a chamber. Every city has an office of economic development. In Dallas, before I left, we actually funded another entity, our own economic development corporation to do redevelopment and development in some of our underserved areas of the city. And that was basically $7 million allocated for that of ARP dollars. Austin has done the same. Um, they have a Austin area, Austin chamber. They have the Austin Office of Economic Development. And the budget for the Austin Office of Economic Development is uh, $53.1 million. So, um, we have to look at a plan and a strategy of addressing economic development 
and where we want to go to make sure our city is competitive and that we promote equity and inclusion. Um, it needs resources. And the current structure is not very viable to really address those needs of a community and attract those things that community definitely desperately needs from grocery stores to convenience retail to workforce development and so on. So a city does a plan every five to 10 years. It's a way of benchmarking ourselves against our peer cities, but also benchmarking our performance. Are these grants and programs working? Is this the right program? The TIF deals, or is a pilot agreement, or is a cash grant? And what is the overall impact of these programs? So and that's the purpose of having a plan or strategy in place. But also, you know, the industry is shifting in the sense of economic development. I think before we looked at the large corporate attraction, which we still do, but it's really about what's the sense of equity? What's the sense of really addressing some of the inequalities within your community? Our site selectors and corporations are looking at that. Uh, data is readily available. So they know our strengths and our weaknesses it's so the question is, how do we, how are we as a city addressing those issues? And what resources are we allocating to address those issues? We know there's, there's a number of food deserts in Nashville. We know there's a number of uh, medically underserved areas in Nashville. We know there's some workforce disparities in North Nashville and Southeast Nashville. Uh, we have rising unemployment in Southeast Nashville. We have a large segment of the population in North Nashville that's not being tapped into as far as the workforce. But we know there are jobs in different markets and a growing tech sector here, technology sector here, that we want to make sure we have our, the workforce ready for where we're trying to go as it relates to technology or becoming a tech city. And so as we kind of roll this plan out, uh, we want to focus on job creation and retention. Um, Historically, we have done a great job of focusing on job creation. Retention, um, the structure's not really there. So I think that's something we need to build. Um, I know the Chamber's talked about it, I've talked about it. Uh, we need to kind of really look at ways of retaining our companies. Um, because if we don't retain them and meet with them and address their concerns, from workforce to public safety, uh, infrastructure, um, they tend to move. Yes, we have a number of companies that come here and want to be in Nashville, want to be in Davidson County, but we don't support them and meet with them and address them, they can move elsewhere, and some have. Um, but also, I, I think you may have saw in the paper in the Nashville Business Journal last week, you know, attraction is just not about you know, business-friendly environment, no state income tax, that's great. But you, there was a company that was looking at Nashville and Denver. And the one company chose Denver because they wanted, they saw in Denver, they saw a sense of equity and inclusion. So as we look at our corporate attraction efforts and bringing businesses here, we have to build a platform that talks about those things. And it has to be genuine and well-funded if we're going to be to continue to be the it city. Mm -hmm. I know we promote that, but to maintain that, you have to kind of pivot and address all the things that make up economic development. Well, can I, I just want to say, because I think that's a huge point, and I appreciate you sharing that, because it, it says a lot that companies, it's not, it's something that should be done anyway, but companies are paying attention to that and really looking into that. So I, I really appreciate you bringing that point. And also the point about retention, because it, it's one thing to bring companies here or get them excited or companies that are already here, but you cannot forget about them. We also need to continue, like you said, to have a program in place that they want to continue to stay um, and continue to make a positive impact on our community, which, which again, uh, it, this all comes back to, like you said, having a resource, having a strategy, which then allows you have to have the resources to genuinely do both of those items. So thank you for sharing that. Thank you. 
I see people need to leave, so I'm going to wrap this up, speed up a little bit. Um, so we want to focus on job creation retention. We want to promote entrepreneurship, small business support. You know, half our businesses in Davidson County are small businesses that have less than 50 employees and make less than a million dollars. Um, those businesses um, hire or comprise roughly half our workforce. Uh, roughly about 200,000 people work for small businesses here in Davidson County. Um, and those, about 200,000. Okay. And those businesses generate roughly about $33.4 billion annually in annual sales. Um, so they are very important. Huge, yeah. Uh, we want to make sure we're focusing on creating new entrepreneurs and having the right programs for entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs um, from technical assistance to providing patient capital in the sense of grants, but also loans that are low cost. So uh, as we look at charging fees, that may be a way of providing resources to these businesses, um, especially small businesses in our underserved markets of North Nashville, Nashville and Southeast Nashville. Um, that goes back to revitalizing our underinvested areas, um, place making, look at our commercial corridors, a Nolesville Road, a Buchanan Street, Jefferson Street, Clarksville Pike, how we look at ways to support these corridors that uh, may be changing, um, but also retain the historical businesses that are there and providing the resources to those businesses that have been in the long term. And workforce development, uh, that is really the main driver um, for attracting and retaining businesses in a, in a, in a city. Uh, we got to find ways to really engage those considered hard to employ. And what we mean by that, those who have been formerly incarcerated, those who may be um, what they call opportunity youth, ages 16 and 24, um, those who may um, be tied to public assistance. How do we get those individuals into the workforce in various sectors, especially within the tech sector, which is our growing fastest growing sector here in Nashville, uh, how do we get them individuals into those jobs that are forthcoming? The Oracles and the Shurians and the Amazons of the world and the other tech companies that are coming here. So we want to make sure that we are growing our own. Um, that's a, a, a term that's being utilized by a number of cities. We want to grow our own and so provide the resources for those individuals to make sure they're back into the workforce. And so in creating the ECD strategy, it's basically be, basically done in four phases. Uh, phase one would be the stakeholder engagement. So you have a steering committee um, comprised of individuals selected by the mayor, but also the council members. Um, you'll have a market assessment, which basically will assess how Nashville compares to our peer cities, both within the state of Tennessee, but also on national level. So our peers are considered Dallas, in Austin, Charlotte, um, of course Atlanta. Um, how do we compare to those cities as it relates to economic development but also our business environment? And then that from there, uh, what are some of the key industries we should focus on? Well, obviously we know it's healthcare, um, technology, te technical services. But what are some of the other industries we should focus on? Is it advanced manufacturing? Is it logistics? Is it hospitality? Um, and so how do you, that's one of the things we're gonna look at or part of this strategy will assess what are the five or six key industries we should focus on for the next five to 10 years to help grow our economy and stabilize it and maintain the, the, the platform we have uh, as it relates to our economy. And then from stage four, phase four, it's really about the goals and strategies and actions for the next five years. So you'll have a, a bucket of short-term goals, less than one year. Uh, from there, you'll have goals basically one to three years. And then there, you'll have um, long-term goals, three to five years. And what does that look like? What is the, who are the partners uh, to help achieve those goals? Is it the IDB? Is it forming a new corporation for 
economic development is it creating new incentives or programs to help foster economic development is it providing um, new resources or identifying new partners on the national level to help us implement our strategy and plan as relates to economic development so possible outcomes you'd be the creation of a nashville edc um, or forming an office of uh, economic development uh, we want to make sure we um, create a stronger and, and, and enhanced workforce uh, developing a world-class you know, entrepreneurship platform and also making sure we build a equitable and inclusive economy for all Nashvillians. So those are some possible outcomes from the plan. And so the plan will be done basically, will basically be done over nine to 12 months of phase one is 30 to 60 days. Uh, from there, you have phase two, the market assessment, another 30 to 60 days. Phase three, the target industry analysis and recommendations, that's basically 60 to 90 days. And so you may have the actual plan created between 120 and 180 days. That's the best case scenario. But in reality, it probably would, be, probably would take between nine and 12 months. So uh, the big goals for Nashville 2022 is really, we also launched this $20 million a Nashville Small Business Recovery Fund under the Mayor's Initiative to support small businesses here in Nashville. Uh, that fund is basically, basically broken out between three buckets. Um, $9 million is basically for grants for small businesses um, that have revenues less than a million dollars and have less than 50 employees. Uh, but in the grant program, there are three buckets. Um, one bucket is basically for North Nashville Bordeaux. Uh, another bucket is basically for our underserved or uh, low to moderate income distress census tracts. And then the final buck is basically metro-wide grants um, for all metro-wide businesses that fall within that less than a million dollar category as far as revenues and less than 50 employees. The second bucket, or main bucket, is a $2 million of the program will be set aside or has been set aside to support uh, marketing and outreach and technical assistance that is very important because what we found out from the PPP loans, the IDO loans, and some of the CARES dollars, uh, that a lot of the word was not getting out to the businesses and underserved markets about the various programs that may have been available. Um, we looked at the CARES data. Uh, we looked at the uh, PPP data from SBA. And, and kind of going back to the CARES data, the program was funded by um, Metro Council. Uh, we only saw a very few limited, a limited number of transactions, say in Bordeaux, 3721A. Out of the um, 764 transactions funded for the CARES program, or $5.4 million, um, there was only nine transactions for those businesses in Bordeaux, 3721A. There's over 500 businesses in Bordeaux. Um, look at 37208 in North Nashville, uh, there was 44 transactions. Well, there's about 1,100 businesses in 37208. So there's some disparities there as far as getting out the capital to those underserved markets. So we want to change that in this go around and really provide a focus uh, marketing outreach effort with our nonprofit partners, but also providing technical assistance. Um, I think every city around the country that deploy CARES dollars and hearing from businesses that apply for PPP under the Pavement Protection Program along with the IDEL program, uh, technical assistance was sorely needed, helping businesses apply uh, for these programs, but also getting their paperwork in order um, from their income statements, the balance sheet, statement of cash flows, um, doing all the registrations with the city. That was a very involved process and so i think we all learned a lot from that and so in this program we're providing the technical assistance with our non-profit partners to really help these businesses apply and also help these businesses get their paperwork in order um, through this process in the final bucket of that 20 million dollar program uh, nine million dollars would basically go to the um 
Nashville Opportunity Fund. It's a $9 million loan program, of which $3.5 million will go for North Nashville or focus on North Nashville as far as providing a low interest rate loans to the area. And then from there, um, hopefully we'll have that plan launched by April 1st of next year. Of this year, I'm sorry, this year, this year. It will roll out April 1st. And um, you'll hear more about that in the coming coming weeks. Um, one of the things I'm working on right now is a, um, a business ret retention and expansion strategy that's currently being created between us and the chamber, Metro and chamber, Metro and the chamber. Um, and it also created the first plan and policy. Um, we should have RFP going out very soon. And one of the main goals I want to focus on is really focus on our commercial corridors, especially in some of our underserved areas of the city. And um, I want to also make sure we're going to support our small businesses here. So I would love to support a thousand small businesses in Nashville with a focus on um, half those businesses being in North, North Nashville. So those are a few of the things we want to focus on in 2022 for the remainder of the year. I'll um, wrap this up. I know we've been here for a long time. Um, yeah, I'll conclude with that. <laughs> so uh, we, we got a long way to go. I, I think some of the questions that relates to this body and what we should be doing, um, as I spoke to Nigel uh, yesterday, it, it may be beneficial for you guys to do a retreat and bring a, in a third party administrator to kind of manage that process to understand what a IDB does, how do you compare it to other development authorities around the country, uh, from your fee structure to your mission to the vision of this body. Uh, what does that relationship look like with Metro, the Chamber, the state? So. Uh, I'm not sure when the last time you had a retreat, but it's very <laughs> common for uh, development authorities, IDBs, to have an annual retreat to talk about the strategy and mission going forward for every year. So I encourage you to do that. I've been involved in those in Dallas, in Chicago, in Atlanta. Um, I, I think it's time. Are those considered public meetings? That's why you have an attorney over there. You got two of them. <laughs> Gosh, you're on the spot. I'm sorry, I was reading. What was the question? <laughs> no, it's fair. Um, you've been here a long time. You've missed a lot of emails. Um, are retreats um, by the IDB considered a public meeting? That's actually a really good question. I would need to check. Okay. I, I would suspect as long as you're not voting on anything, that probably would be fine, so they would not be public, but I would need to check on that. Okay, so, and I would anticipate just to help you with that, that we would discuss things like fee structure and our relationship with Metro and stuff like that, that would ultimately have to be voted on by the IDBA. Sure, and so in that situation, it may, it may have to be a public meeting, but I'll, I'll just have to double check on that and get back with you. Okay, thanks. Go ahead. No, I'm tired, man. I've been up for <laughs> well, we're, two, we're, two hours of sleep last night. So. All right, well, we're... we're uh, oh, that was so much information. Thank you so much. Yep. And can you email that to us or put it in the... Yeah, absolutely. So we can go back over it. And yes, ma'am. And, and certainly, thank you, Courtney. And, and Board Member Forster, as you know, we, we had talked about doing something similar to this several months ago. Um, and part of this was certainly to have the strategy, but also... Uh, unfortunately, obviously, just due to COVID, we didn't. But certainly, to have some background on what are what are the basic items in our toolbox, what have we done, what are some of the deals that have passed before. So hopefully, that gave you and some of our newer board members some background as well. Um, so yeah, thank you, and we'll certainly spend more time on this. I know I, I have some questions too, but I'm just due to timing. We'll we'll move on. So Courtney, thank you, and appreciate you putting that that and working on that and we look forward to discussing that further at, in future meetings so thank you um, moving on to the next item on the agenda and again we're way over on time so we have to uh, leave the space so I'll, I'll keep my comments brief in chairman's report uh, a couple items so Tom sensitive number one uh, we are obviously as we've discussed previously in the process of um, finding new bond Council, issuers council, um, 
and we, we started that process. And, and uh, again, I'll, I'll be brief on it, but we are coming to, we're moving forward in that process. And so I want to talk with the, or share with the group, probably would be beneficial just due to timing to have a meeting, two meetings next month in March, uh, so that we can devote the first meeting specifically to uh, the bond issuance and, and again, uh, without getting too great, de great of detail, because I shared this in January, the idea would be uh, to have the uh, potential replacements as our bond council before this body. Uh, so it would be a public meeting, but that would certainly give everyone on this board to uh, ask each of the uh, potential candidates questions. Uh, obviously we would not necessarily have them in the room together, but probably devote about 30 minutes to each candidate. Uh, Again, every board member could ask questions and then certainly we could discuss um, after. So again, just due to timing, likely that needs to be a separate meeting. Uh, we have already checked dates. I, I appreciate it, Joy, thank you for your help on this. So for that meeting, we would potentially look at if we want to stick to Wednesdays and do 10 o'clock, uh, March 9th. Uh, just how does that work for everyone's schedule for as of now? All right, anybody have any issues with that, major issues with that timing? Again, trying to stick to Wednesdays and 10 o'clock. Uh, so we'll, I will ask a joy if uh, we'll confirm that everything is good with that date and then we'll, we'll get that out here shortly, the calendar invite. And then, so March 16th, again, uh, one of the things I've tried to do is chair, uh, as you know, several months ago, set a set meeting date just so when people need to come before us, they know when we're meeting, we know when we when we have meetings, so it's just great for everyone's schedule. Um, however, so <laughs> uh, March 6th, the week of March 16th is spring break. Um, I will be available, but uh, I, there it may be, it may be that some, some individuals with kids who are in school, um, you know, may be out that week. So I would propose that we push that meeting back to March 23rd, just for March. Uh, does anyone have any major issues with that date with their schedule? All right, so again, that would be our regular meeting that we normally have, uh, but we'll, we'll confirm that and, and get that out. Uh, obviously, we talked about the Amazon Red program. Uh, we've talked about that the last several meetings, uh, the affordable housing program. Just due to timing, I'll provide some updates on that at our, at our next meeting. Uh, so anyway, again, just due to timing, we'll, we'll kind of move quickly here. So that's that's all I have for now on item six on the chairman's report. And again, we'll we'll get calendar invites out for, for those dates next month. Let's see, item seven, approval of financial matters. Uh, Rhonda Petley with Metro Finance is here to tell us about the board's financial position. All right, thank you. Thank you for that. Uh, let's move to, are there any questions about the financial matters? Okay, thank you. Uh, with that, let's move to item eight adjourn. This concludes our agenda today. <laughs> I'd like to thank the members of the board, Metro Finance, Metro Legal, and all the attendees for attending today. With there being no further business, I will entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. All right, and, and Josh, I don't need a second in, on this, do I? I'm gonna say no, so I think you're good. <laughs> all right, that sounds good. With there being no further objection, the motion carries. You all have a wonderful day. Thank you all.